Alrighty. Um, I think uh, I think campus is up now. Uh, I've been using it all morning, uh, so uh, I think uh, sometimes uh, you might have to refresh your Canvas page or close the tab and then reopen it um, if there's something funky going on uh, uh, in the back end. You know, most important thing, Ravinda, is that you, you're here. Okay. Um, and don't forget, uh, people, that uh, uh, I have posted uh, a set of what I call clean slides uh, to Canvas uh, under uh, our course Canvas, uh, under modules, under lecture slides. Uh, you can uh, open that slide for uh, that slideshow for today, uh, uh, Tuesday, July 26th. Uh, you'll have all of the slides for today. Uh, you can follow along with my lecture, uh, download those slides, print them out if you wish, download them to your devices uh, and uh, take notes on them. Uh, so that's uh, a real convenience for you. I will also upload my slides after lecture, uh, and those after lecture slides uh, are all marked up with my notation and comments and additions and so on, uh, and uh, we'll call those my marked slides. Those will also be uploaded shortly after our lecture today, okay? And every day. We'll do that every single day, okay? All right, we're uh, just about a minute from launch here. Uh, yeah, Yanshu, um, could you uh, maybe um, uh, uh, copy and paste uh, the Zoom link um, to um, to this court uh, to this uh, meeting, uh, and then send out an announcement to the uh, uh, maybe we could send out an email. Uh, that would that would be a good idea. Uh, let me just take uh, just take a couple seconds to do uh, to do just that. Okay, I'm going to toggle away from uh, the class for a moment. Okay, I'll, I'll take care of that. Uh, I, I will take care of that. Let me just take a moment here. I can find it. Uh, Gary, uh, some students mentioned that the uh, Canvas doesn't work, I think. Yeah, but the link, uh, the, the, of course the app does. Uh, let me just, um, let me just see here. Um, Okay, I'm just gonna, yeah, I understand that. Uh, so they can't access via Canvas, but they can access uh, via the link, okay? Um, just take a second. Here we go. All righty, and then... Uh, and we 
see here. Um, Okay, that should be it. Okay, so we'll see. Uh, oh gosh. Uh, okay, hold on a second here. And I can do it this way. Uh, sorry, people. Um, I realize some students are having difficulty. Let's see, we have 73 students. We should have about 30 more than that. Um, uh, let's just see here. Where is this? Unbelievable. The nightmare. How do I reply? All right. Oh. 
All righty, that was pleasant. Hello, everyone. Um, so, I've sent a link to the uh, students who are still having difficulty, the, all students, uh, particularly those who are having difficulty with uh, uh, Canvas uh, coming in through Canvas, uh, the Zoom ID. Uh, meeting ID and passcode uh, do work. Uh, so we're all on the app here together. Um, one of the first uh, glitches of the term uh, for Econ, um, uh, for Econ uh, 100B. Uh, uh, in any case, welcome. Uh, my name is Professor Jerry McIntyre. I'm a professor, typically a professor of economics uh, at uh, a New York University uh, in New York City. Uh, I have a, a PhD in macroeconomics and international macroeconomics uh, from UC Santa Cruz many, many years ago. And I typically come back uh, to teach uh, Econ uh, 100B um, uh, in the summer, uh, one of the summer sessions. And so it's a pleasure to uh, uh, be here again, although I'm, I'm uh, though my background looks like uh, Westcliff. Uh, in point of fact, I'm in, uh, I'm in New York City in uh, downtown uh, Manhattan, uh, right near NYU. Um, in any event, uh, you should be able to see my um, see my slides, uh, my PowerPoint slides here. I delivered these uh, on, I posted these rather on Canvas uh, this morning. Uh, these are listed under Canvas, under modules, and under uh, lecture slides. Uh, they are available a few hours before classes start. You can download these slides. Um, you can print them out, put them onto your device, uh, take notes along with the class. These are the full um, uh, and, and detailed lecture slides. I will make comments on these slides and those comments. Okay, all right. Um, well, <laughs> getting interrupted here. Uh, yeah. Okay, all kinds of interruptions here. Terrific. Um, so in any case, um, here's the uh, very, uh, typical course information. Um, my email address here, uh, the Zoom lecture with the passcode. Uh, the Zoom meeting ID rather. My office hours are immediately after our lecture, uh, but they will be at a different um, at a different uh, uh, Zoom meeting ID uh, with a different passcode. And notice all of our times, regardless of where you are. Many of you, of course, in Santa Cruz, but uh, some of you are other places in California or even in the United States or in other countries. Um, all times uh, quoted here. Uh, uh, and this course uh, will be Pacific Daylight Time. In other words, Santa Cruz, uh, Santa Cruz time. Okay. Um, discussion sections begin this week, uh, and uh, uh, they begin on Thursday. Uh, we're lucky uh, to have uh, two excellent TAs uh, with us, Yu Chao, uh, who will be leading the Thursday um, discussion section. Um, uh, from 11 to 12 and his office hours then are uh, uh, 12 to 1 um, at this particular Zoom meeting uh, ID uh, and uh, if you need to use the passcode here. And then Yan Shu, who's also sitting in today monitoring chat uh, for, uh, for us um, and uh, has the uh, recitations on Friday uh, from 11 to 12 and uh, Yan Shu's uh, Office hours are from 12 to 1 on Friday uh, at this particular um, Zoom link uh, or this particular meeting ID with passcode. Okay. Um, uh, well, a uh, question there in the chat. I don't always uh, respond to the chat questions, but that's an important one. Usually I, I leave it to uh, TA, the TA Yan Shu uh, to talk, but I will talk about that particular chat question. Uh, it is optional, as he says, but very strongly recommended. Uh, there will be specific. Uh, problem sets uh, assigned to uh, discussion sections every week, okay? Uh, one set has been posted already on Canvas. Uh, in that, uh, that those uh, uh, so-called discussion problem sets, uh, you are responsible for those. You don't have to sign up for a specific one, uh, but it's strongly recommended that you attend uh, one of them, if not both of them. Uh, some students do that, 
and should students do that? Uh, and you will review those uh, those discussion uh, problems uh, with the TAs. Uh, those discussion uh, problem sets are not turned in and they're not graded, but they closely resemble uh, the quizzes and other assessments and assignments um, in this uh, in this course that you will be assessed on. So the idea is these discussion problem sets are very closely related to your graded uh, the uh, graded quizzes and so on that I'll discuss later. Uh, so it is strongly recommended you go to uh, one of the two discussion sections. Okay. Um, let me outline the course goals uh, for you uh, right at the, at the start. Uh, what we want to do is we want to uh, translate, it, uh, transmit to you uh, something about how the U.S. macroeconomy operates. The U.S. economy is still uh, by far the largest economy in the world. Um, it is complicated. Uh, there are over 330 million people, uh, tens of millions of different kinds of businesses, a very large government sector, all interacting on a daily basis to change goods and services, react to interest rates uh, and economic events. Uh, and we want to try to make sense of this, uh, this complex social uh, reality. That's our ultimate goal in this course. Okay, uh, We use macroeconomic models to understand and, anal and analyze uh, the U.S. macroeconomy. Okay? These models are, as you know, any model is a very uh, simplified version of the economy, but not too simple. Right? Uh, every model uh, keeps in the most important things and leaves out the extraneous things. Uh, it has to have the essentials, right, but not things that are unessential. And that allows us to analyze and look at particular macroeconomic problems. We will look at macroeconomic problems in three different kinds of, um, you might say, different kinds of runs. Uh, first, a very long run. The very long run is somewhere between 30 years and 100 years. Uh, this is a period of time that doesn't get much discussion in, say, the popular press uh, or uh, commentary on the nightly news, uh, but is ultimately uh, perhaps the most important thing for uh, the U.S. economy. Uh, over certainly a 30 to 50 year time horizon, uh, the performance of the U.S. economy or your home country's economy, for that matter, um, will determine your standard of living. Uh, what kinds of wages you'll be able to earn, what kinds of jobs you'll be uh, uh, working in, and so on. Okay, we'll actually start with that kind of run, the economics, if you will, of several generations of, 80, of, of 30 to 100 years. Okay. Uh, then we'll talk about the long run. Uh, the long run is a period of time, oh, I don't know, from uh, five years uh, out to 10 or 15 years or so. Okay, and these don't overlap necessarily. Uh, this is a period of time, the long run, in which um, the economy has suffered some shocks, perhaps in the short run, you know, like the global financial crisis in 2008 and 2009, or the COVID pandemic shock and the policy shock uh, in 2000, uh, 2020 to, to, well, now, uh, 2022. Those are short run shocks, but the economy will eventually write itself, readjust, and come back on track or come back on trend, okay? And it will take the long run, a period of something like five to 10 years for the economy to come back okay, to its trend or come back on track. The long run looks at, well, when the economy has come back to normalcy after, say, short run shocks. So it's not a situation which the economy is growing over generations, but it's not a situation in the long run. It's not a, a period of time in which there are shocks. Okay, it's a period of time when the economy is acting normally. Okay, we'll turn our attention to that in the second part of the course, and then the third part of the course is the short run. Of course, the short run is from now out, out to about three years or so. As I mentioned, there's no real overlap here. I'll just give you an idea of, of the time frame we're looking at here. Um, the short run is when uh, most uh, is the is the period of time in which most economic commentary is concentrated. What's going to happen to uh, uh, inflation and unemployment over the next year or two? That's the short run. Okay, uh, is the U.S. economy going to move into recession uh, over the next year or so? That's actually going to be crucially important uh, for those uh, uh, for those graduating students who are taking this course. Uh, um, 
And so that's uh, that gets most of the commentary in the business press and in the nightly news uh, and, and among uh, among people on, around kitchen tables across this country. And well, that's the third part of the course. And we'll uh, address that uh, in the last uh, week and a half or so. Okay. Each of these um, each of these runs, however, the very long run over the course of generations, the long run when the economy is acting normally, or the short run when the economy is experiencing shocks. Uh, and policymakers try to do something about those uh, uh, the, do something about those shocks. Each of those runs have the same economic variables, irrespective of the run. Right? Uh, we'll always talk about real GDP. We'll always talk about the consumption behavior, consumers, uh, the consumption behavior, and the total amount of consumer spending. We'll always talk about business investment. Okay? We'll always talk about government spending uh, and taxation. Okay, those variables are the same across all the runs. Okay, that's what makes it difficult in a way. You know, in a way, keeping track of how uh, how these different uh, models work at these different time frames will be the the most difficult part of the course for you, because every model will have consumption, investment, government spending, taxation, and so on, and real GDP. Uh, but every run will have a different kind of model or models uh, that explain these behaviors. Okay? And keeping track of uh, how consumption behaves in the short run relative to how consumption behaves, say, in the long run, relative to how consumption behaves in the very long run, okay, will be the kind of overarching meta problem uh, for you. Okay? You have to be able to handle the runs, okay? uh, the models within each run, but also to be able to handle how the models differ and are, uh, are consistent, but also differ across these various runs. Okay? Um, we will apply uh, these uh, uh, the appropriate models, depending upon the run, uh, to a variety of macroeconomic problems. Right, that the U.S. economy and other economies face. I'll very often make reference to Europe, China, Japan, Venezuela, uh, Argentina in this course. Um, we'll apply uh, these models of these runs uh, to macroeconomic problems and evaluate particularly uh, uh, policy effectiveness. Uh, is there something policymakers, uh, government officials can do uh, to help ameliorate uh, the situation? Um, uh, for uh, uh, for uh, for a country, okay. Right. So uh, some of the course topics I've kind of touched on some of them already. Um, uh, our economic growth. Uh, this is the very long run. If I use the abbreviations, so the BLR. Okay. What happens over 30, 50, a hundred years? Um, uh, that will be an important uh, part of this. Um, uh, Yanshu, are we uh, are we answering these questions here? Um, I don't see. Uh, uh, yeah, see I, I, I'm answering these questions. Okay. Yeah. Sure. Okay. I see lots of uh, lots of questions here, but uh, we want to get on those answers. Uh, thank you. Um, so, um, uh, the top, some of the topics of the uh, economic growth over the very long run: money and inflation. Inflation is has been noted as the number one. Uh, macroeconomic and political problem uh, facing the United States economy today. We'll talk about money and inflation. We'll talk about unemployment. Uh, unemployment is at historic lows right now. Uh, we'll talk about short-run macroeconomic fluctuations, which is sometimes called the business cycle, how the U.S. economy moves through periods of recession and expansion, uh, how that happens, why that happens, and what policymakers can do to smooth out the effects of the uh, 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 macroeconomic fluctuations. We'll talk about stabilization policy, how uh, policymakers use tools to uh, try to stabilize macroeconomic fluctuations. We'll talk a little bit about international macroeconomics, not a lot, but a little bit. And we'll also discuss the recent global financial crisis. Uh, this is the crisis of 2008, 2009, and also um, uh, sometimes called the GFC, global financial crisis, and also the, the COVID shock. Um, We'll make uh, uh, some reference to uh, the both the the virus itself, but most importantly, probably um, the policy response to that virus, uh, which we're still in in some ways uh, uh, the government's response to that virus, is the effects of which we're still um, uh, living with uh, to some degree. Okay, um, COVID is a very special situation, so. Um, 
Uh, sometimes in special situations, they don't apply. Uh, the special situation doesn't apply to the general case, but sometimes special situations, extreme instances, bring out something we haven't seen before. And we'll talk about that uh, in this in this course as well. Right? Um, some course policies. Um, well, first, uh, we cannot operate in this course without uh, respecting goodwill. Okay, all members of Econ 100B must treat uh, all other members with respect and goodwill. It's not possible to be have an honest uh, and uh, reasoned discussion of social and economic uh, issues uh, without uh, this re reciprocity among us. You'll, you'll notice that uh, that I and our TAs will always treat you with respect, and we hope uh, that you will treat us and all your classmates uh, uh, with the uh, 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 respect and goodwill. Okay. Uh, regarding academic integrity and the honor code, uh, it is important that students adhere to the principles and practices uh, in the honor code and maintain uh, the highest integrity in your academic work. Always shoot to be the best person you can be in all endeavors, not just in Econ 100B, but everything you do to be that best person. When people think, oh yeah, 100B with that student, and yeah, he was amazing, or she was um, incredible, or, or that student was just uh, an outstanding person. I learned a lot from them, from their example, and so on. That's the kind of person uh, you always want to shoot uh, to be, to be free, uh, personal prejudice, and recognize your obligation to help create uh, an, an atmosphere sphere of mutual uh, trust and respect. Uh, that's what I expect for students. And uh, having taught many, many years um, at UC Santa Cruz, uh, I know I can expect that from, from all of you. Um, expectations uh, for the course, academic expectations for the courses. Students uh, must read uh, the chapter prior to class, okay, and then reread uh, 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 after the class. Okay. The textbook that we use by uh, a well-known macroeconomist, Greg Mankiw at, uh, up at Harvard, uh, is, I know students don't believe this, but it is the best written textbook in all of economics. I know I know that's hard for you to, probably hard for you to believe, but it is. Um, he has a, a statement in the preface that every single sentence in the textbook has been reworked uh, for clarity of exposition to be understandable uh, to students. Uh, and uh, having said that, the first time you read the chapter okay, uh, that we're covering, uh, only expect to understand maybe 60% of the material. Okay? Then you come to class, come to lecture, we work through, we dig down into the essence of the, of the model of that chapter, okay? and then your uh, uh, understanding will rise dramatically. Okay? A rereading will take you up to 80 or 90% comprehension of that chapter. Okay? Alrighty. Um, next, uh, students will be active in lecture and discussion sections. I see a number of uh, responses in, in chat at the moment, uh, and that's uh, really good. Uh, and uh, Yang Shu, I hope, is answering your, your questions about the administration of the course. Uh, but of course, as we move along, your, your questions uh, and comments will be uh, more substantive and, and content-driven uh, regarding macroeconomics. You should also uh, be active in discussion sections. Okay, and what we mean by uh, uh, active is at least uh, here in, in lecture, uh, asking questions in chat or raising your hand. Don't forget there's a, a raising hand function uh, in Zoom. Uh, and uh, in discussion sections, uh, many discussion sections, probably most discussion sections will break uh, the class up into groups called breakout rooms uh, where you solve individual questions uh, that will be uh, related uh, to the various quiz questions that uh, you all uh, have to challenge in this course and be graded on. Uh, and you should think about uh, volunteering, uh, stepping up and volunteering uh, to lead uh, your uh, uh, to lead your breakout room. Uh, when you lead a breakout room, you kind of record the answers and then you report out to the rest of the, the discussion section what your answers are and what they what they mean. Okay, that's uh, that's uh, uh, taking a leadership role, an active leadership role in discussion sections. Uh, you should just, uh, again participate in these uh, activities on a regular basis. Students should also keep up with macroeconomic events. Okay, uh, from a good uh, financial news source um, and. Uh, uh, most uh, daily newspapers are not good enough. Uh, uh, you probably want to read uh, one of these following. The Economist magazine, uh, which uh, 
is published at economist.com. Uh, we love the name of it. Uh, and is uh, uh, has a wide variety of uh, uh, free content for uh, students to peruse. Uh, they publish on a weekly basis. Uh, they have a section on, Mac, on, on economics. Uh, they have a section on different parts of the world, Africa, Latin America, Europe, North America, and so on, Asia. Uh, the Wall Street Journal, published here in New York City on a, a business uh, as a business daily. Uh, and the Financial Times, which is a London newspaper, it's a uh, if you know about the Financial Times, it's a pink newspaper printed on pink paper uh, and is an excellent source of uh, business and macroeconomic uh, uh, news. Most newspapers are not uh, and other news sources, uh, online news sources are not a good uh, um, uh, source of, 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 of macroeconomic news. Uh, prerequisites for the course, I'll list these here, all of Econ 1 and 2 and 111B rather, uh, or the equivalent. Uh, if you haven't passed all of these, you cannot take this course. You certainly cannot survive in this course. There's plenty of calculus, plenty of mathematics in this course, plenty of uh, analytic uh, geometry in this course. Um, and uh, to survive, you have to have an excellent understanding of the calculus and graphical analysis. If you don't, this, this course is going to be very, very challenging for you. Um, 100B uh, contains quite a bit of mathematics, but on the ultimate focus, uh, will always be on the academic, I'm sorry, economic uh, applications. Uh, and you'll find um, that uh, it turns out with enough practice, uh, with what we do here in Zoom lectures, with what you do uh, in uh, discussion sections with the TAs on the, working on the discussion uh, problem sets, you will eventually handle the challenging mathematics. You know, I have no that I have no doubt about that. Okay, it'll be difficult at, at first, uh, very likely, uh, and then you'll rise up uh, to the challenge. The most difficult thing at the end of the course uh, will be the economic intuition and economic reasoning. Okay, and so let me give you an example here, and I'll repeat at the very last class right, uh, that when we start this course, one of the one of the first models we will pull apart uh, with our mathematical toolkit is the solo growth model, uh, probably the most, maybe the most famous model and most prestigious model in all of in all of economics. And we will take that model apart uh, in detail uh, in a way that you've never really never seen before using mathematical tools of calculus and analysis. Um, and it'll be challenging for you. But by the end of the course, okay, uh, you will be hoping and praying that you get a solo growth question on uh, the, the second longer quiz. Okay. Because you know you'll be able to solve it, okay? The problems coming at the end of the course are mathematically quite kind of easier, but intellectually and economically much more challenging, okay? Uh, and that's actually the, the way uh, economics works at, at, at most levels. So that, uh, and, and your TA, Jean Chu and, and Yu Chao, uh, can uh, testify to this, that a PhD program in economics uh, starts out with extreme uh, challenge in mathematical uh, technique. Uh, but ultimately, students, uh, if they pass uh, their exams, uh, can handle that. And then comes the real challenge, the real heights, the real summit, uh, which is uh, the economic understanding. And that is really the tough part. Okay? Uh, but I did want to highlight uh, that for you uh, today. Okay, here's the required textbook. Uh, it's uh, Macroeconomics by Greg Mankiw, the 11th edition. All right. um, you may use earlier editions of the textbook, they're cheaper, okay? Uh, but if you do, okay, you, the student is, is responsible. I, I keep getting this message here. I, I keep getting interrupted somehow. Um, uh, in any case, um, uh, you, the student, are responsible for any differences, any and all differences between the, the edition you're using and the 11th edition. The chapters may be different. The content may be different. The pagination may be different. The problem sets may be different. Uh, that's on you, not on me. I don't, uh, not, on, uh, not on the TAs, okay? Uh, so uh, be aware of that, okay? Uh, also be aware of pirated online versions of this textbook, okay? They do not, in general, contain all the content, problems, and applications used in this course. And so uh, students have, uh, have downloaded a, a pirated version. It doesn't contain half the chapters or half the pages. It looks like it does, but it ends up not doing so. It doesn't contain the problems that they have to do. Okay. Uh, 
Um, this uh, textbook, you can use uh, the electronic version of the textbook, uh, which I sent you uh, links to in, in the email and is on the, um, on the course syllabus, okay? Regarding our lectures, okay? Um, students are expected to attend every lecture and uh, discussion section, okay? Um, I do not re review material for students who've uh, missed the lecture. Okay, recall uh, that these lectures are uh, beforehand or uploaded uh, and placed on Canvas. Uh, so you have all these lecture notes uh, available to you, um, but I do not review them if you've missed class, okay? Um, these lecture slides are posted to Canvas under modules, under slides, okay? I call these clean slides because they don't have my, you know, no silly notation. Okay, like this. Uh, and you may download these uh, to take notes from uh, during this lecture. After class, I will also upload to Canvas um, uh, my marked slides. These are my marked slides uh, with my notation, which will be more complicated in a couple of minutes. And they will be posted up and they'll, they'll be called marked slides. And so in the, in the module that's, uh, that's uh, called lecture slides, you will have two versions of, say, uh, today's lecture. The clean version, which was posted well before class this morning um, that you can use to take notes. And then the marked version that is posted after class, which has my notation and additions and comments and little lines and, and analysis and so on. You might uh, uh, find, you should find that both versions are useful to you, okay? Um, regarding Canvas, um, uh, all announcements, lecture slides, both clean and marked, discussion problem sets, Canvas quizzes and longer quizzes, I'll come to those in a moment, uh, are posted to Canvas. Everything is posted to Canvas. And these longer quizzes and uh, uh, Canvas quizzes are graded automatically on Canvas. So going through Canvas is going to be crucial uh, uh, for this course. Okay? Um, you should check Canvas every day at least. Okay, and this for this uh, course material. Uh, regarding your course, uh, regarding your course grade, okay, students are usually uh, interested in that. Uh, and uh, I, I think, uh, Jan Stu, um, um, you might want to take uh, that, uh, and, uh, that, uh, that hand there. All right. Yeah, yeah. Um, awesome. Okay. Katie, yeah. Okay. Um, regarding uh, the calculation of your course grade, here's how this will work. Um, We'll first calculate an average from what we call your Canvas quizzes. I'll get to that in a second. Um, uh, but there are about eight of these uh, this summer. Uh, the summer course is, uh, is uh, five weeks. So there's roughly two per week. Uh, the first uh, Canvas quiz will open up tonight and will be due uh, tomorrow at 7 p.m. Um, there are eight of these approximately. Uh, they will count for 300 points. Your average will uh, be the average. Uh, if you get a 70% here as your average, we'll multiply 70% by 300 and you'll get 210 points. Okay. Um, and of these eight quizzes, uh, Canvas quizzes will drop your lowest score. Uh, we know internet problems happen. Uh, that's, uh, that's the run of the mill. Uh, and so your lowest will be, uh, will be dropped. Okay. Uh, next is Longer Quiz 1. Uh, that's due on Sunday, August 14th. That's also worth uh, 300 points. Okay. Um, and so if you get 60, oh, let's say, let's be more optimistic, 80% there times 300 is 240 points. All right. You get the idea? There'll be Longer uh, Quiz 2 on Friday, uh, due Friday, August 26th. Okay. Also 300 points. Okay, these longer quizzes are cumulative and they are longer than regular weekly, the bi weekly, uh, uh, twice weekly Canvas quizzes. Okay, and if you add up this, this is 900 points, but it, you know, kind of should be a thousand points. Uh, and what we'll do for you uh, is we'll place an extra hundred points on the highest of your scores, on the highest of either uh, the can your Canvas quiz average. Uh, or your longer quiz, uh, or uh, first longer quiz, or your uh, a longer second quiz. Whichever one of these is the highest will give you a uh, hundred extra points on that uh, to to uh, improve your improve your grade. Okay, all right. Uh, most of the quizzes are something like uh, objective, fill in the blank, uh, uh, calculate, put in the number for the answer, 
uh, select the correct answer, true, false, uncertain, which of the following choices are necessarily correct, which of the following choices may be correct, which of the following choices cannot be correct, something like that. Uh, they are, you would call them objective uh, questions, okay? That doesn't mean they're easy, okay? Sorry, Ryan, you, you probably know that. Objective questions doesn't mean they're easy. Okay, I'll talk more about uh, the quizzes in a moment. Uh, then once we have the points from this scheme, okay, uh, well, your grade will be determined uh, by the following scale. Okay, and this is the standard, uh, the standard scale. Okay, Alrighty. Um, so about these uh, quizzes, uh, first there's two kinds of quizzes, longer quizzes and canvas quizzes. Canvas quizzes, recall, they're about eight this term. And we drop the lowest. Uh, these are based on lectures, the textbook, and importantly, discussion problem sets. So working on those problem sets and discussion is important to prepare for these Canvas quizzes. Uh, they're typically, uh, Canvas quizzes are available, well, on, Quen, on Canvas, under the quiz uh, tab on the left-hand side for 24-hour period, okay? They're usually due on Wednesday and Sunday before 7 p.m. on each of those days. So they're open for 24 hours. That means uh, there is a, the first Canvas quiz is open uh, must is due on Wednesday uh, tomorrow at 7 p.m. So it will be open or available, I should say, uh, 7 p.m. tonight based upon this lecture. Okay, And then the next one will be open Saturday at 7 p.m. and due Sunday at 7 p.m. Okay, And so on through the term. Okay? Um, once you have opened a quiz, there is a time limit. The time limit is about two minutes a question, okay? And then you must complete it. And if you have not finished uh, during that period of time, uh, Canvas will close you out uh, and grade what you have completed, okay? Students with academic accommodations have uh, the time adjusted according to their academic accommodation, okay? Um, for example, a Canvas quiz of, say, 13 questions must, in general, be completed in 26 minutes. You will be notified of the time limit uh, for each of the quizzes. Okay. Um, other features of Canvas quizzes. You'll see one question at a time. Okay. You'll answer that question, go to the next question, and you will not be able to go back to previous questions. Okay. You'll see each one individually. All questions and all answers are randomized. Okay? Questions are pull, pulled from a large test bank of questions. The questions you face on question one, two, and three are not necessarily the same as some other students' questions of question one, two, and three. Okay? The answers are also randomized. Okay? The likelihood that any student will have a question or a, a quiz like any other student is practically zero. Okay? So uh, other features of these Canvas quizzes, as I mentioned, they're available for 24 hours on Canvas. We know internet problems happen. We drop your lowest Canvas quiz for that reason, okay? You can open the quiz only once within the 24 hour period, okay? They average 10 to 12 questions, sometimes slightly more, sometimes slightly less uh, than 10, sometimes slightly more than uh, 12, but that's the neighborhood. That's what we're shooting for, okay? Um, Quizzes are timed, usually complete within within uh, two minutes a question. That's uh, 20 to 24 minutes in general, okay? Time is tight on purpose, okay? And the purpose is this, that with two minutes a question, say for a 12 question Canvas quiz, you have 24 minutes. It is simply not possible to look up everything, to consult your books and the notes to get all the answers. In other words, okay, you have to know the economics to answer these quizzes. You have to know it already. And that means uh, you have to study for quizzes just like you'd study for exams. But they're in managed, small, manageable pieces. The, the first Canvas quiz uh, open tonight, uh, available tonight and due uh, tomorrow at 7 p.m. is just based on this lecture uh, and the course syllabus. Okay. Um, the next one on to do uh, on next on Sunday will be based upon the two lectures and so on. Okay, uh, so it's a manageable piece of material, but you do 
have to study for it, okay, a small manageable amount of material, okay, uh, to keep pace with the course. It's not possible to look everything up. 24 minutes is a purposeful, tight time frame. Uh, understand? Okay. You are not allowed to communicate in any way with anyone in the universe during the 24 hours a quiz is available. That means all of your, you cannot communicate with any of your classmates, nor the TAs, nor me. Okay? You're on your own during that period. Okay? Okay. So, what about longer quizzes? Longer quizzes are also on Canvas. They're also available for 24 hours. Once open, there is also a time limit of two minutes a question. Okay. Uh, but longer quizzes, uh, the longer quizzes have, well, more questions. So, for instance, a 20 question longer quiz must be finished in about 40 minutes. And each of these longer quizzes will have uh, the stated amount of time uh, on the instructions. Okay. Again, just like Canvas quizzes, all questions and all answers on longer quizzes are randomized. And the first longer quiz is available on Saturday, uh, August 13th, uh, and uh, closes on Sunday, August 14th. And the second longer quiz is available from Thursday, August 25th, uh, to Friday, August 26th, uh, the last term, the last day of the term. Okay. Yeah, it is purposely, I, I think I've mentioned this a couple of times, so uh, it's not interesting to hear that two minutes isn't a lot of time. That's, pur that's a purpose behind that, okay? Next, uh, give you a, a handle on what a typical week in Econ 100B looks like, okay, in the summer. Things move quickly in a quarter system, okay, and things move at hyper, at hyperdrive, uh, in a quarter system in the summer. So here's what the week looks like. Tuesday, we have our Zoom lecture. Here we are, okay? Um, then on Tuesday evening, a uh, Canvas quiz is available for 24 hours starting at 7 p.m. And that's true tonight, okay? Wednesday, the Canvas quiz is due uh, by 7 p.m. Okay. Thursday, there's another Zoom lecture, all right? From one uh, to 4.30. Saturday, the second Canvas quiz of the week is available for 24 hours. It's at 7 p.m. Okay. Uh, and the Canvas quiz uh, on uh, 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 is due uh, 7 p.m. on uh, on that Sunday. Okay, right, but that's the typical week, and then we start again on the following Tuesday. All right. Good. Uh, just to, uh, as a note, uh, recall that discussion met, uh, sessions. Uh, sections meet on Thursday and Friday, uh, uh, both days at 11 uh, to 12 noon at the TA's uh, Zoom meeting ID. Okay. Uh, and notice that means uh, what this means is uh, you're kind of on your own on that Wednesday uh, Canvas uh, quiz. Okay. Uh, because uh, the discussion sections are in here. Uh, and they will, you know, they'll look back towards the uh, questions from the previous uh, uh, Canvas quiz, but they'll also be looking forward to the next Canvas quiz. Uh, so that means uh, the Wednesday Canvas quiz, you're kind of on your own on that. Okay? Uh, there's a reason for that also. Everything has a reason. Okay? Um, other administrative details. Uh, there are no makeups given in Econ 100B. None at all. Okay. We do, on the other hand, uh, drop your lowest Canvas quiz. Right. Uh, academic accommodations, if you qualify, you should, uh, 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 for ac accommodation, I believe you qualify, uh, you should con uh, contact uh, the Disability Resource Center uh, during the first week, okay, for uh, setting up your uh, accommodation. Very happy to do so. And of course, uh, we've already mentioned academic integrity. Uh, you must know and understand and abide uh, by the UC pol UCSC policy on academic accommodation, uh, academic honesty and integrity. I strictly follow these uh, principles. Okay. All righty. Uh, so uh, starting to turn towards more of the economic content of this course, uh, it's important to be able to keep up with macroeconomic events and analysis. So things are happening in the US economy all the time uh, affecting uh, the nation's uh, macroeconomy, and you want to keep track of that. One way of doing so, I've mentioned reading uh, The Economist magazine, 
the Wall Street Journal, the Financial Times. Okay, I also read on a daily basis uh, a variety of macroeconomic blogs uh, using a, uh, an R RSS a feed reader called uh, INO Reader. These blogs are by some of the uh, top macroeconomists in the world. Okay, one of which is Tyler Cowen, the Marginal Revolution, Paul Krugman. Uh, as a Nobel Prize winning economist, has a blog at the New York Times. Uh, Scott Sumner probably has the most interesting take on the global financial crisis and monetary policy, uh, recent monetary policy. Uh, now James Hamilton and Menzi Chin. Menzi Chin was uh, uh, one of my PhD advisors uh, for my PhD at Santa Cruz. Uh, he's now at the University of Wisconsin. Uh, and David Beckworth, who also has an interesting take on, uh, on macroeconomics and also has an interesting uh, podcast, uh, daily podcast on macroeconomics. Uh, these are some of the best, sharpest uh, macroeconomists in the world. Uh, they comment on our uh, daily, uh, daily, they comment on macroeconomic events. Uh, and so it's uh, by reading these, uh, uh, these macroeconomists, all of them PhD economists, uh, one of them a Nobel Prize winner. Um, you, it's as if you're kind of sitting in a seminar room uh, with some of the smartest people in the world uh, talking about a uh, first cut of, of, of uh, uh, macroeconomic, uh, macroeconomic events and how we should think about those and how our models, uh, how our models address some of these issues. Okay. Um, uh, and so I would strongly recommend uh, you you take a look at these on a daily basis. I I typically read these uh, you know before breakfast uh, in the morning, uh, and very often they set the debate uh, for macroeconomic policy. Okay. Um, here's the course schedule. Uh, this is an ambitious schedule uh, for the course. We will start at the beginning and simply work our way down uh, down the list. Okay, uh, so as I've mentioned, uh, there's a little typo here. Um, uh, you should read chapters one, two, and uh, quest and, and chapter three point one on your own. Uh, chapters one and two define things like uh, GDP, uh, investment, the consumer price index, inflation. Uh, chapter three point one takes you into what's called the production function, which we'll mention in a in a few minutes today. And that will be uh, certainly new information for you. Uh, but really, we're starting here, okay? Uh, and our start uh, will be chapter eight. Uh, this is economic growth. This is what I call the very long run. In a way, we're working backwards. We're looking at the time period of 30, 50, 100 years, working backwards to the long run and then the short run. Right? We'll start with the very long run, all right? Uh, then we'll look at uh, the long run, unemployment, unemployment, inflation, and then uh, short run policy uh, analysis. Uh, the longer, first longer quiz uh, will happen uh, right here at this date on the 13th and 14th, right around the introduction to the short run, and the second longer uh, quiz that will happen at the end of the, at the end of the course. Okay. Uh, yes, the first longer quiz, uh, the first longer quiz will uh, concern the first part of the course, and the second longer quiz will contain the second part of the course, okay? Um, announcements, uh, other announcements I need to make. I mean, I know there's a lot of content coming at you very quickly. Uh, this will be the only day we do this, but in general, this will be this, our starting page, an announcements page. An announcements page will tell you what you should have done to, for today and the topics we'll be covering in any upcoming assignments, okay? And in general, this announcements page will be our first page, okay? So for instance, today, well, the introduction to the course. And I've mentioned, uh, you should read chapters one, two, and 3.1 on your own. There is also a math review uh, posted on Canvas under modules, under math review. Uh, this contains all the calculus uh, you need uh, for this course. Okay, uh, differentiation, log differentiation, partial differentiation, and so on. Okay, uh, and then, uh, our first uh, real content of the course is in chapter is in chapter uh, eight, uh, economic growth part uh, part one. Okay. Um, then Thursday, well, I will certainly we will certainly continue with chapter eight, and then very likely push on into chapter nine, uh, the first part of chapter nine, uh, economic growth part two. Okay. And then next uh, Tuesday. Okay, in our lecture, uh, we'll probably finish chapter nine and then push into uh, chapter 10, growth empirics and policy. Okay. 
right? Regarding upcoming assignments, okay, I've mentioned this a couple of times. Um, first, uh, there is a Canvas quiz right, on Canvas uh, under quizzes. Uh, it's available tonight uh, at 7 p.m. and it's due right, uh, by 7 p.m. tomorrow. Okay, so it's so so. Let's just be careful, uh, completely careful about this. It's available for this 24-hour period. Okay, Tuesday, 7 p.m. Here's Wednesday, 7 p.m. You watch this lecture, you study, you read the book, you do the, you read the math review, uh, you do some work on the calculus, right? And at some point in here, you open up, you open up your quiz at a point of your choosing. In that period of time, you'll have two minutes of question, about uh, 24 to 26 minutes, I've forgotten how many questions there are, to answer it, and then that window closes, okay? So yeah, yeah. I think that's straightforward. Um, next, uh, the other upcoming assignment is there is a discussion problem set one. It's on Canvas under modules, and that's due in discussion sections. It is not graded, okay, it is not turned in, Okay. But it's important for you to struggle on that, work on that discussion problem set. We'll just call it a problem set from now on, uh, so that you are ready to be able to get you ready to be able to do uh, quiz questions. Okay. Um, so, does that make sense to you? Okay. Are there any uh, any questions on this before I go to uh, substantive uh, substantive material here? Uh, Gary, I think there are some questions. Uh, sure. Uh, yeah, the, the first one is uh, someone still mentioned they cannot access to the canvas. So, uh, so uh, because the first quiz is start from today, so I think. Uh, well, we'll see. Uh, so I, I have uh, reports in my email that uh, that uh, UCS CITS says that that problem is uh, uh, is resolved. Okay, so we'll we'll okay. check that out. Yeah. Okay, uh, and there there is another question is uh, someone asked is. Uh, if there is a time limit for individual question in the quiz, or is oh no, a... yeah, that's a good that's a good question. Yeah, I, I I stated it like that, but that's an excellent question. Thank you, whoever or however many people ask that. No, uh, the the overall quiz has uh, has a length of uh, two minutes of question. So as I mentioned in that example, if you're facing a thirteen minute can a thirteen question canvas quiz, you have twenty two minutes of question, about twenty six minutes to finish the quiz. Any given question, you can spend five minutes or five seconds on that question, right? That makes sense. That makes sense to people, okay? But once you finish the question, once you submit your answer to that question and move on to the next question, you cannot go back, all right? Yeah, you cannot go back. That's right. right. So, you know, uh, some questions, you know, you'll know right off the top. Boom. Oh, that's, uh, you know, the unemployment rate uh, and some date was this. I remember that from lecture, right? Other questions, of a 10-second answer, okay? Other questions, you'll have to do some calculations on a notepad, right? And so on, okay? And then work it out. I might take three minutes for that question, right? but you're still ahead of the game, okay? Submit, put your answer, select your answer, submit, and go on to the next question. So only the only the, the quiz itself is under a time frame, okay? Uh, under time constraint. Does that make sense to people? Yeah? Anything else, Yanshu? Uh, thank you, Gary. I think there's one more question is, when will the uh, homework uh, solutions will be posted? Yeah, uh, after, after that's a great question also, after your Friday, uh, uh, Friday uh, discussion section. Okay, so your Friday discussion section ends noon Friday, uh, Pacific Daylight Time, and it'll be posted shortly after that. Okay, uh, thank okay. you. I think that's the question so far. So if there's uh, okay. any other question, please let us know. Okay, everyone. Yeah, okay. yeah ask, yeah, sure. Ask uh, questions uh, in the chat and uh, Yanshu will uh, generally uh, uh, give you uh, excellent answers on that. Okay, terrific. Those are all good questions. Thank you for that. Uh, let's get into some economics, okay? Um, regarding the US economy, right? This is a macroeconomic course, you're all, Many of you are econ majors. I think not, not all of you are econ majors, but many of you are econ majors, certainly thinking about becoming an econ major. Um, you know, what about, um, uh, what about, uh, how much do you know about the US macro economy? Okay, let's take a, let's take a look at this. Uh, for example, um, uh, 
how many of these uh, kind of basic questions about the U.S. economy can you answer correctly? Think about these. We don't need to get any responses in chat, but think, think about this. First, uh, what is the growth rate of U.S. real GDP? In other words, from, uh, and notice the, the way the form of dating here, uh, from 2021 with a colon one, that means the quarter, quarter one of 2021 to quarter one of 2022, okay? How much did U.S. real GDP grow over that time frame? 70%, 0.8%, okay? Notice it's real GDP. Recall that any variable that's real, okay, uh, means that that variable has been adjusted for prices and inflation, okay? So this means real G, the growth of real GDP simply means the growth of real production in the economy, real goods and services produced within the economy uh, from uh, the first quarter of 2021 to the first quarter of 2022. How, what was that growth rate? Okay, think about that. Do you have a handle on that? Second, what is the U.S. unemployment rate in June of 2022? That's the latest figures we have. Okay, we'll talk. We'll have a section on unemployment and how it's calculated and, and so on. Um, you know, uh, what was that rate? That is a snapshot. The unemployment rate is boom. What was it right, in uh, the week of the 12th in June? Okay, I remember that was, uh, you know, we're July 26th right now. That was six weeks ago. Right, that's the latest data we have on unemployment. What was that rate? Do you know? Do you have any clue? 30%, 1%. Five percent. Next, what is a U.S. CPI inflation from June of 2021 to June of 2022? Notice that uh, a couple of features here. CPI inflation means the percentage change in the CPI, which is the Consumer Price Index, an index of uh, consumer prices that uh, the average family of uh, urban family of four faces, how much did that index change from June of 2021 to June of 2022? Notice the inflation rate is a percentage change over a period of time. Unemployment is a snapshot of what it is now. Inflation is a, a, a percentage change over a period. Okay, what is that? That's gotten a lot of press recently. And lastly, uh, what is, um, what is uh, the effective U.S. federal funds rate today? Okay. Uh, let me ask you, and uh, I think, I think uh, it, it might be fun to kind of open up, uh, uh, to have someone raise their hand uh, on this. Uh, what is the federal funds rate? Not, not the number, but what's the concept? Can someone raise their hand on that? Uh, I'll take the first hand on, on that. Any any volunteers here? No volunteers on that. Uh, David in chat. I'll. Uh, 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 that's the kind of question you can ask me in office hours. Any any volunteers for um, what the federal funds rate is? Somebody should be raising their hand. We have two hands raised. Okay, uh, let's see here. I know I can't I can't get those hands. There we are. Uh, uh, are you? Yeah. Uh, I'll ask you to unmute there. Hi. Uh, How so you doing? The federal. I'm doing good. How are you doing? Uh, so so FFR is what uh, banks use to control the inflation. It's basically mm. an okay. an example would be like. Uh, when they raise the interest rates on the loans they're giving out, that would uh... mm, not, not quite, not quite. It's not the bank. It's not necessarily all of the loan, the interest rate on all the loans banks give out, but a certain kind of class of loans, right? So you're you're close. It's a particular special interest rate, okay, uh, that banks that banks charge, all right. Uh, but it's not quite. It's not quite. All, all the loans. And someone else? Someone want to take that up? Somebody else just disappeared their hand. Sorry. You want to? Yeah. Yeah. Hello. Yeah. Uh, go ahead. Yeah. Is, is this Amin? Yeah, this is Amin. Hi. Right. Good. 
Um, is it just like the interest rate that uh, banks charge to borrow things? It's, it's it, well, that's all banks do, right? Uh, they oh, borrow yeah, and lend, right? That's what they do. But the question is to whom, for how long, what kind of, David, you want to, uh, I'll ask you to unmute on that. It's not quite, not quite that either. I mean, yeah. Yeah, the, the federal funds rate is the, is the rate banks charge each other for extremely short-term loans that they make to each other. Oh uh, yeah, it's, it's but no real money gets transferred. It's just numbers. How, well, 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 let's let's, let's 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 cut that off there. Uh, here's the feature. Uh, I see you've already uh, muted yourself. Uh, uh, here's just how short. But uh, usually, this less, is the usually twenty-four hours. I, just one day. In fact, it's called uh, a way of describing the federal funds rate is to talk about it as the interbank overnight lending rate or borrowing rate. So both of the other students were right. It was some kind of interest rate. It's an interest rate that banks both charge and uh, pay, right? Uh, but it's the interest rate that they charge and pay one another for overnight loans. That, that's a, a loan for, in general, a 24 hour period, okay? Um, that's, a, that's a very short, a very short term loan, okay? Uh, since it's a one day loan, essentially an overnight loan, we take whatever that number is uh, and multiply it by 365, the number of days in the year, to uh, annualize that interest rate, okay? Uh, because most interest rates are expressed at an annual rate. When your bank tells you your savings account earns 2% interest, they mean uh, if you put your money in that savings account and keep it there for a full year, one year, you will have 2% more money at the bank, okay? Uh, so uh, the, the effective federal funds rate is the overnight, oops, the overnight interbank lending rate or borrowing rate. It's what banks charge one another, as David said, for a one night loan. And then that number is annualized. Okay. Um, that's a good question from Arya. Uh, this is the baseline cost of funds to banks. Okay. A steel mill has its, its key inputs are um, iron and uh, coal. Okay. Um, the key inputs in an education process are, are students and, 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 and professors. Right? In uh, a bank, the key input right, is funds. What banks do, the key input they need to secure and, and get access to are additional funds so that they can lend them out. Right? And what happens in the overnight market okay, is banks at the end of the day, they look at their overall balance sheets, how many funds they have on hand and how many funds they need for tomorrow's business. And if they have excess funds, they are willing to lend those funds, monies, to other banks right, overnight. Other banks look at their balance sheets, look at, look at how many assets and, and, uh, and uh, short-term uh, uh, liabilities they have, and they may need funds for the next day's business. They then want to borrow funds from someone else. Banks at close of business here in New York, that's 5 p.m. Banks contact one another, okay? Uh, via secure phone lines and make deals. Banks with excess funds lend those funds to other banks that are short of funds and they charge one another an interest rate. Uh, that interest rate, right, the overnight interbank lending rate, JP Morgan may charge Chase, Manhattan, uh, sorry, JP Morgan may charge Bank of America such an interest rate. Okay. That's the uh, called the federal funds rate. I will notice, uh, point out here, that this is a market interest rate. Banks are charging one another, okay? The Federal Reserve, the reason the, the word Fed here enters into this interest rate is that the Federal Reserve monitors this interest rate. And later in the course, we'll see those tools that the Federal Reserve can use to either raise the federal funds rate or lower the federal funds rate. And when it raises and lowers the federal funds rate, the overnight interest rate uh, that banks charge one another, it is raising or lowering the key cost of the banking system doing business. 
Okay, and that will have profound effects on the macro economy in the short run. Okay, but the question then is, what is that rate today? Okay, that's that's all. That's what we're stopping at today. Okay. Well, let's take a look at these answers. Okay. What is the growth of uh, U.S. real GDP from the first quarter of 2021 to the first quarter of 2022? 3.5%. Is that big or small? It turns out that's around the average, a little bit stronger than average, a little bit faster than average. Okay. Next, what is the unemployment rate? What was the unemployment rate in June of 2022? Uh, that was six weeks ago. Okay. That's 3.6%. Okay. But that's pretty low. Okay, uh, not quite the lowest on record, but almost. Okay, uh, what is U.S. CPI inflation? In other words, the percent change in the consumer price index from June of 2021 to June of 2022. Well, that's gotten a lot of headline news. Uh, that is nine percent. Okay, uh, so over the course of this year, uh, average prices as measured by uh, the consumer price index, an index of uh, prices paid by a typical urban family of four, have increased by 9% in one year. Okay. Uh, and lastly, what is the effective federal funds rate? Okay. The effective federal funds rate, the overnight interbank lending rate, quoted at an annual rate, is uh, three, uh, rather 1.58%. Uh, we some, you'll sometimes see that referred to as 158 basis points, okay? Uh, and that means, of course, uh, that uh, 100 basis points is 1%, 200 basis points would be 2%, 25 basis points or 25 BP would be a quarter of a percentage point, okay? Uh, and so, um, uh, the federal funds rate has increased uh, recently, okay? and this is the highest it's been for mm, uh, most of the last decade. Right? Let's take a look at some of these uh, uh, some of the, some of uh, these data. Okay? On the next couple of slides, we have some, uh, and if you're following along at home, um, you have my slides from the my clean version of the slide. You can see the following uh, graphs first. Uh, though I asked you, uh, uh, prompted you for real GDP, we first have to talk about nominal GDP. Anytime you see the word nominal in a macroeconomic context, nominal means in terms of money. Okay? Uh, and nominal GDP, as, a, as of the first quarter of 2022, uh, was about uh, 24, tr just over $24 trillion. Right? That's a tremendous amount of uh, of national income in money terms. We'll use an abbreviation for nominal GDP. It should be straightforward. We'll call it NGDP, okay? Uh, nominal gross domestic product. In other words, uh, the market value of all final goods and services produced within the domestic economy in a given year at current prices, right? And so think of nominal GDP, the way I tell students to think of nominal GDP is to think of it as the, like a national cash register. Every single thing that is produced in the, in, in, within the borders of the United States is rung up. So this is my little clock here, keeping track of time. Uh, my, I don't know if you can see that, there it is. Um, and, and suppose this was produced uh, in 2022, uh, that would be run over uh, the national cash register, it costs $25 at Brookstones, uh, and that would contribute $25 uh, to a US nominal GDP, okay? And every other, pardon me, uh, every other item in the U.S. economy, produced in the U.S. economy, every other good and service produced in the U.S. economy in the given year would be run through the national cash register, okay? That means uh, we're taking the quantity of all the goods that have been produced and multiplying them by their price, okay? And so there's two ways in which nominal GDP can increase. Nominal GDP can increase if the quantity of things is increasing, but nominal GDP can also increase if the price of things is in increasing. And when the price of things is increasing and that causes nominal GDP to rise, um, that's not necessarily a good thing, okay? Uh, with the 9% inflation uh, in over the past year, um, 
nominal GDP will naturally rise, uh, rise uh, increase because, because of this price effect. We want to know what has really happened. The number of goods and services, that, the expansion of the number of goods and services produced in the domestic economy. And that's the variable nom uh, real, of real GDP. I want to make a couple of other comments about this uh, graph. Uh, this graph, you may notice, has some gray shaded vertical bands. These gray shaded vertical bands are the recessions, periods of time in which the US economy has recessed or uh, slowed down. Okay, and you can see many of them here. I know there's some course as well. Okay, uh, that also means uh, the white bands, uh, which are much larger, are the expansions. From here to here. And you can see happily uh, for our country, um, the expansions are much more common and uh, larger, longer, I should say, uh, than the recessions. Okay, uh, this is a graph that was generated uh, by the Federal Reserve, uh, the Federal Reserve's website called the FRED website. Okay, um, and uh, indicates uh, the amount of nominal GDP in billions of dollars. This is called a time series graph, in that the graph is across time, going back to 1947, just after the Second World War, up until um, the first quarter of this year. All right, we don't have information for the second quarter of this year. That means we only have a GDP data nominal GDP data or real GDP data uh, up to the end of March in 2022. Remember March? Here in New York City, it was snowing, okay? Um, that's a long time ago, right? Uh, and much has happened in the U.S. economy since then, but we do not have data on GDP right, uh, for that in the intervening period from March until today. We have other data that's more timely, and we'll talk about that in a moment, okay? In any case, uh, the real GDP data, okay, and of course the symbol would be our GDP. The real GDP data, the quantity effect, the total number of goods and services produced within the domestic economy in a given period of time, such as a year, uh, is the nominal GDP divided by some kind of price index. And the price index, it says, is $2,012. And that deflates right, a nominal GDP into real GDP, okay, and tells us the actual quantity of goods and services produced at 2012 prices. And you can see happily, uh, again, you can see the recessions. Here they are. And the expansions. Here. And here's another one. Right? And here's the longest one. And so on. Um, notice uh, that um, a couple of features about uh, about this as we're looking at uh, recessions and expansions. Is it the case uh, that in recessions, real GDP falls? Look at this chart for a moment and raise your hand on that. Is, is it the case that real GDP falls in every recession? Yeah, what do you think? I have David's hand, a couple other hands. Let me see some other hands out there. Alexander? I just wanna give more, more act, get more action from more people. Alexander, yeah? Um, it looks like it does fall. Yeah? What about 2000, the recession, the very short recession in 2001? Uh, you see, you, uh, let, me, let me highlight it. Yeah, it looks, right. yeah, I guess it stays that, pretty steady. That, that's, I, I'd have, to, yeah, I'd have to say that's flat. I'd have to say that's flat. But can you, can you, uh, don't go away, Alexander, hold on a second. 
way, way to go. I wanted to follow up with you. Sounds good. Alexander, there yeah. you are. Okay. Yeah, good. You're back. Um, can you save yourself there? Sorry? Uh, can you can you adjust your answer? Is it is it look look at this graph, right? Here's the expansion of the 1990s, right? You see it? Yeah. And then this. So how might you, you know, save save this particular uh, save this particular and then there's another case here, right? This is flat, right? And this is kind of flat uh, as well. These are the flat ones, okay? At least three flat ones. Do you see, does anyone see how this can be saved here? You might say something like this, okay? Um, this, and this is the recession of 2001 from uh, March to November of 2001. Um, and um, the economy was rapidly growing. This is the 1990s. This is the expansion rapid expansion of the 1990s, and then it hit a flat part, okay? It stagnated, okay? And so a recession in this particular period of time was not a period in which GDP was falling, okay? But rather it had been growing fast and then went sideways, okay? Uh, and had fall, you might say this, it had fallen off its previous trend. You understand? It had fallen away from the trend that had been established in the 1990s. Okay. Um, uh, Elias, you still have your, your hand up there. So uh, I'll ask you to unmute. Yeah. Do you have a, a comment on that? Or you... No. Good now. Okay. Yeah. Uh, okay. Uh, and, and Canyon? Do you have a comment on that or your hand just got stuck up there? Are you just saying that like yeah. actual GDP in dollar doesn't have to decrease in a recession, but like the GDP growth rate would? Uh, possibly. I, I'm going to, I'm just putting that out there, right? It's not, and don't forget these, these dollars are in 2012 dollars, right? So they're in real terms, but it's, it's not the case. It is not necessarily the case that a recession occurs only when GDP is falling. Okay. Right. But it, rather a, a recession uh, uh, falling relative to its trend. That's the key. Does that make sense to you? Yeah, thank you. Okay, okay. And well, that means immediately we have to think about the trend. What, what was, what's the trend? Uh, what does that look like? What determines the trend and so on? Okay, we have a special name for that trend. And of course, that's that's coming up on the next few slides, okay? Um, so um, we can see these, uh, we can see these, you can take your hand down now. Uh, um, so uh, let's take a look at uh, the growth rate, which is the actual question, the actual question. This is the growth rate of real GDP, okay? Uh, and it was 3.5% uh, uh, from, uh, uh, this should be the first quarter of 2000, uh, uh, 21 to the first quarter of 2022. It's right here. That's 3.5%. And the long run average, as it turns out, is just a shade under about 3% per year, right? Right about in here. Just slightly less than where we are now, or another way of saying it, uh, over the last uh, year up until uh, March of 2022, the U.S. economy was growing uh, rather a slightly faster uh, than its long run average, slightly faster than slightly faster than trend, and you can kind of see that on the previous slide. This is oops. you can kind of see this on the previous slide here. It's growing rather fast here, okay, faster than its previous trend. Okay, that's the idea. Uh, another variable we'll be interested in this term is U.S. real GDP per person which of course is just real GDP, the, our variable Y, we'll use Y as our real GDP variable all through this course, uh, divided by the entire US population. The US population is uh, uh, around 330 million people. And when we divide that uh, in terms of 2012 dollars, uh, we get a, a figure of just short of $60,000. 
But that's in 2012, though. If you know, remember 2012? Uh, probably none of, most of you don't. I certainly don't remember what prices were in 2012. Okay, We live in 2022. That was 10 years ago. If I translate that number into today's prices, okay, uh, $59,431 in 2012 prices is about $74,226 in uh, last year's prices. So well, that's a considerable amount of GDP per person. Okay, It's one of the highest levels in uh, the world. It's not the highest. Uh, apparently, Singapore is the, has the world's highest uh, GDP per person right now. Um, uh, but uh, it's one of the highest in the world, and it's certainly the highest among any large countries. Okay? Singapore, of course, is a, a small st city state. Um, uh, but uh, the United States GDP per person or GDP per capita, which we're seeing here in 2021 dollars, is about $75,000, which is astonishing to me. Okay? And you can see it has grown dramatically over time going back to the Second World War here in 1950. I don't want to uh, you know, belabor the point here, but uh, you know, there was somebody in our Zoom meeting who was alive in this year, right? Uh, and in that year, okay, uh, GDP per person was about, in real terms, it was $30,000. Now, it's double that. Okay, and that person, of course, is me. Uh, maybe somebody else in the class, but certainly me. Um, and uh, you know, I didn't do any. I didn't do much to contribute to that doubling. Okay, I, sure, I uh, stayed alive. I went to school. I built in education or human capital. I got experience as being a professor, uh, but uh, th that was essentially my contribution. Other people. Okay, strangers to me educated me at Santa Cruz with my PhD. They provided me with capital. I'm using an Apple uh, iPad and an Apple laptop. Uh, Steve Jobs and his company and those people who worked that built that for me so I could do this. The people who uh, developed Zoom uh, helped me be productive. Right? Um, other businesses uh, invested uh, and uh, uh, made the car I drive and, and the furniture I use and the shirt I wear. Uh, Others in the economy, complete strangers to me, have contributed uh, ideas, innovations, uh, uh, products, investment, capital goods that have made me more productive and allowed me to be uh, earn a much higher income. And the rest of uh, um, the average U.S. citizen higher income. Okay, that topic right, of how does the average income uh, double right over forty years in a country? is the topic of the first part of our course, economic growth. How did this growth happen? Not the business cycles, not the squiggles, okay? okay, But rather this overall upward trend, okay? And it is the most important thing in my life and your own life, right? If it had, the US economy hadn't grown, I, more or less the average person, I guess, uh, I would still be making $30,000 a year, okay? Uh, but I don't. Uh, um, that's the process of economic growth. Other fact, um, we mentioned the trend line. Now, the trend line of GDP has a name, and its name is potential GDP. This is the trend line, and you can see it here. The trend line is in blue, and the actual GDP, real GDP, our variable Y, is in red. And then you can see here. Uh, uh, as the analysis that I, I did, uh, the, the comment I made earlier uh, to several students is that um, a recession is not necessarily a reduction in GDP, but rather a falling off of GD, real GDP from its trend, from its former trend. Okay. This trend line, real potential GDP, is estimated in a way I'll describe in a moment, uh, by the Congressional Budget Office. Okay. This is what the economy could achieve if things were going normally, or behaving normally. And sometimes the US economy falls off of normal, falls off of trend. Okay. The trend 
is the growth, the long run growth of the economy. And you can see it in blue. This US economy is growing. That's the trend. And that's our first topic. But there is a business cycle. There are downturns and expansions. And you can see them very readily. Here's one. This is the global financial crisis in 2008 to 2009. Here's the recession I mentioned to Alexander, I think, um, in 2001. Uh, here's COVID. I right? had a big fall off in COVID and a big rapid recovery bounce back. Boom, boom. We've never seen that kind of behavior before. Here's uh, a double dip recession. Two recessions relatively close to one another in the early 1980s. And so on, all the way back. Okay, and you can see the expansions as well. Okay. Uh, so, um, this trend line has a name uh, and it's called potential GDP, and that uh, variable. I, I'm going to open up, sorry, I'm going to open up my, uh, uh, that, oh, I might as well show you, I don't know, I think, I think I'll do this some other time. Uh, we'll call potential GDP YP, okay, real potential GDP YP. Um, I want to give you the definition uh, of real potential GDP, this, this trend line, okay? Uh, potential GDP is the output produced if all resources were being utilized in their long run equilibrium levels. Okay. Well, what does that mean? All right. The resources we're talking about, the key resources are gonna be labor, capital, right? other inputs and in technology, okay. but particularly labor and capital. So it means as far as the labor market is concerned, the economy is producing its potential real GDP. If the unemployment rate is that it's a long run level or what we call the natural rate of unemployment. And the natural rate of unemployment has a particular symbol. Notice there's lots of notation being built in already. Uh, and that symbol is U for unemployment sub N. The subscript N means the natural rate of unemployment. This is between four, typically thought of as being between four and 6%. That is when the US labor market generates an unemployment rate in the long run between four and 6%, the US economy's labor market is performing normally at its long run equilibrium. Okay. Second, uh, the capital market, those are two of the most important sources, labor, L for labor, K for capital, technology, other inputs, K for capital uh, uh, means the capacity utilization rate is at its long run equilibrium level, which is about 80%, just, just short of 80%. Okay. The capacity utilization rate indicates as a measure of how much uh, of our, our factories uh, and our mines capital is being used to produce goods and services. The long run equilibrium uh, capacity utilization rate is just short of 80%, just the 79.6%, I think it is. Um, right. Notice uh, that means that about 20% of the, of the capital in the country uh, is uh, unemployed, even in the long run equilibrium. Okay. Um, well, what's that capital doing? It's, it's, it's a piece of machinery, capital is machinery and equipment. Uh, that is not being utilized at the moment. Why might it not be utilized? Uh, well, businesses buy extra machinery. Some of them are being repaired. Some of them are being uh, refurbished. Some of them are being retooled. Some of them are put away uh, because the, the amount of demand is not necessary. They only run those machines. Maybe they're older machines um, uh, when there's a, a run on, on, uh, on the business, uh, when there's extra demand for products. Uh, that, uh, in, in some sense, you might think if the capacity utilization rate is 80%, then the long run unemployment rate for capital is about 20%. Uh, and that means that 
capital suffers in a way more unemployment than labor does in the long run, okay? which is a curious way of thinking about it. Uh, in addition, uh, uh, the other resources we're talking about, the inputs and technology are being used at their long, efficiently at their long run equilibrium levels. Okay. This uh, number, YP, is, as I, I mentioned, calculated by the Congressional Budget Office. The Congressional, Congressional Budget Office is uh, an office, a nonpartisan office uh, in the U.S. Congress. Uh, uh, staffed by hundreds of macroeconomists that try to estimate and provide economic data to the Congress and the president, um, but they try to estimate what the U.S. economy could produce okay, uh, under normal circumstances with the capital, the labor, technology, and other inputs available for the U.S. economy in the long run. Okay? And then we can compare that number, that estimated number, potential real GDP to where the U.S. economy actually is. And if it's below that, the U.S. economy is below its potential, then the economy is in uh, recession. If the U.S. economy is above its potential, which is possible, okay, potential is not an, an ex, a, a maximum, but just what it, it could produce normally, the U.S. economy occasionally goes over its potential if there has been a, a prolonged rapid expansion in the economy. Okay. Um, to give, a hand, uh, give you a, a sense of what we mean by potential, that the U.S. economy can move beyond its potential, above its potential, uh, let me give an example of your work habits. You can work above your potential for a short period of time. My guess is that uh, coming up to the long, first longer quiz and the second longer quiz, you will do uh, more than the usual an average long run equilibrium amount of studying for Econ 100B, okay? You will move your workload above potential for a short period of time, okay? And then after the first, say, the, the longer quiz one, you'll come back to your long run equilibrium average rate of studying, okay? So you can move beyond your potential for a while, okay? That's how potential is defined here, okay? Um, the potential output also has a couple of synonyms that uh, terms that we will use as, as synonyms for potential output. One of them is called the natural rate of output uh, or the natural rate of GDP. Uh, since Y is GDP and the natural rate has an N in it, we'll call this Y sub N. Okay. Uh, that will be equivalent to Y sub P for us. And the other uh, synonym for potential output will be full employment output. Uh, and so since we have an F here for full, we have an F here. And these are all the same okay. as far as we're concerned. There are slight differences in that we won't be concerned about that in our course. All of these refer to trend real GDP, trend production in the economy. Okay. And if the economy falls off of that trend, it has moved into a recession. And here it is. You can see, um, here's the global financial crisis. It has a birthday, actually. Its birthday is December 2007 to June of 2009. That's here. That's this distance. Uh, and you can see the U.S. economy in that recession falls off of trend. And then it takes a long time, a long expansion for the economy to recover and come back to uh, come back to trend right here. It only came back to trend in 2018. That means it took nine years for the US economy to come back to trend after the global financial crisis in 2008, 2009. Notice COVID, COVID is here. COVID was not an ordinary recession. The US economy had a very sharp and immediate downturn in April and May of 2020, right? During the lockdown, it was not caused by the virus, right? The economic calamity was not caused by the virus. It was caused by the government policy response to the virus, okay? But has bounced back very rapidly, right? from a very long distance away uh, until we're roughly at potential today, 
right? That's one of the most rapid recoveries and expansions. You can see the expansion in 2001. You can see the economy, as we mentioned with Alexander, went sideways, right? And then took well, out to, well, this is 2015. I'm sorry, 2000, uh, sorry, 2006 to get back. That's a five year. It took five years to get back to normal, to get back to trend. The COVID recovery took only right, two years. Right. Again, a dip, the double dip in the 19 Earl A's and then uh, four years to recover. Okay. So COVID, COVID, the COVID uh, downturn is very special. It wasn't caused by economic phenomena. It was caused by not really even a virus, but the policy response to the virus and uh, has another unusual uh, feature in that the recovery was very rapid as well. Okay. Um, so the next point here, I want to talk about the definition of a recession. I've used that term uh, and we've defined it in, a, in a, a loose way. I want to define it in a much more careful way now. So far, we've talked about it as a fall off from trend. Okay, and that's a good graphical um, definition, right? Uh, but the definition most economists use is much more technical, and we, we want to keep track of that, okay? Uh, first, uh, the definition of a recession has been developed by uh, a private research group called the NBER, the National uh, Bureau of Economic Research, okay? It's a private uh, think tank, if you will, and... Uh, a research uh, um, uh, institute in uh, Cambridge, Massachusetts, the NBER. Um, and it might be a good idea uh, that the definition of recessions and the declaration of recessions is done by a private firm and not the US government. Do you understand why? It may be the case, remember the US government is run by politicians, it may be the case that the U.S. government would want to delay or somehow influence the announcing of recessions, okay, and the ending of recessions uh, for political purposes, okay? Uh, private, a private concern would not have that kind of political pressure. Okay? In any case, most economists accept the National Bureau of Economic Research definition of recession and their dating of recession, when the recession starts, when the recession ends. Okay? I'll go through that with you. Um, uh, the NBER, this research group in, in Cambridge, declares the dates of business cycle peaks and troughs, okay? So a peak uh, is something like this. Here's time, and here's real GDP, our variable Y, and here's the trend line, YP, right? And then the economy fluctuates around that, something like this. And this point here, is a peak, and this point here is a trough. And from peak to trough is a recession. So if you know the date the peak occurs, and you know the date the trough occurs, or you declare the date a trough occurs, then you know the date, the two dates, the start date and the ending date of the recession, okay? Likewise, from the trough to the next peak, which is up here, that's the recovery. So knowing the trough date, the trough is the absolute bottom, and the new peak, the next peak, that's the recovery or the expansion, I should say. Okay. And so the NBER and their key committee, the Business Cycle Dating Committee, declares the the peak dates and the trough dates, and therefore defines the start and ending of recessions and the start and ending of subsequent expansions. So a recession is from peak to trough, and a recovery or expansion is from trough to peak. Okay. Um, note one thing here, and it's come up uh, recently in the business press, is that most economists do not use the definition that you often hear in the newspaper uh, that a recession occurs to real GDP uh, declines for two consecutive quarters. 
Okay, and the reason is uh, a, a point that Alexander made earlier. We made with Alexander. Uh, there are recessions in which the economy has fallen off of trend, not performing up to its potential. Even though, right, the U.S. economy has only gone sideways. Okay, seemingly gone sideways. The real GDP has not declined, but it hasn't kept up to its trend or potential growth. That's the idea. And so here's a, a, a stylized version of, of what I drew on the on the previous uh, slide. Here is a peak, business cycle peak. Here is the trough. And of course, the recession is from those two dates. Okay. And so this date is the date of the peak. And this date is the date of the trough. And this period of time here is the recession. Okay. Um, so to dig down further, uh, uh, how does the how does the MBR declare uh, the dates, uh, these particular dates? It declares a recession starts when there's a significant decline in economic activity. Okay, the key word here is significant. It can't be a tiny little blip on the chart. Uh, if you look back on the previous slides, there's always some kind of fluctuations in the U.S. economy. Think of, uh, think of uh, the U.S. economy as a huge aircraft carrier, right? Uh, the world's largest plowing along. It has a trend, it has a path it's on. And there are always waves that hit an aircraft carrier and they move it around just a little bit. Okay, But they're not recessions or expansions. They're just the normal kind of everyday flux. But sometimes there's a, a tidal movement. Okay, You hit the Gulf Stream or one of these other powerful currents and it does move the economy off of its path. If it moves it below its path, it's a recession. Okay. And that has to be significant. Okay. Or there's another, uh, uh, another current comes in and moves the economy significantly off its path in the positive direction. That would be a recovery. Uh, recessions are significant declines in economic activity, not the, not the little waves that always buffet a country's economy. Second. Um, the decline has to be spread across the entire economy, across the entire country. It can't just happen in one sector, housing or tech. It can't just happen in New York, right? Uh, or in California. It has to occur, right, across most, if not all, sectors in the economy and most, if not all, uh, regions of the country, in the Northeast and the Southwest, and so on. It's an overall decline in economic activity uh, spread across sectors and across uh, regions, geographic regions. It has to last for a few more than a few months. It can't be a little blip and a recovery. That's why uh, COVID is, uh, uh, many economists think it's so peculiar, the COVID downturn, that it probably shouldn't be classified as a recession because it didn't come from the usual economic uh, reasons. Uh, it came from a government lockdown and it was so quick, the turnaround was, uh, was so rapid uh, that it didn't really last for more than a few months. Okay. This particular piece, which seems very reasonable, you can't take a one month decline. We didn't have a recession for four weeks or something. Right? Uh, that, 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 would be, uh, that would be too short to think about. That has a profound implication. Uh, I'll come, come back to that in a moment. Right? Um, and it must be typically evident the recession must be typically evident as a decline in most, if not all of the following five variables, okay? Real GDP should decline, but it doesn't have to. And remember the exception that I mentioned with it, uh, Andrew of 2001, okay? It doesn't, that's necessarily the case. Uh, a decline in real income, uh, the actual income people uh, earn. That also did not happen in COVID. Weirdly, real income in the United States actually rose in COVID because the government transferred uh, a great deal of income to support people who were thrown out of work due to the lockdowns, okay? So there's an exception there. A decline in employment, that almost always happens in recession, okay? A decline in industrial production. Industrial production is the production of our factories and mines, okay? That all, almost always happens in every recession, and a decline in sales at the retail level, uh, in the stores, uh, and sales at the wholesale level among businesses. Okay? It's not necessarily that all five of them have to happen, 
uh, but they almost always do. There are some exceptions, as I've mentioned here, okay? Uh, but it's usually the case uh, that um, most of them are in decline in recession. Then that prompts the NBER to declare uh, a business cycle peak. Once it declares a peak at the top, it's all downhill after that, okay? Um, I wanna focus on this one here. This has a profound implication. Right? Does anyone see that? Then raise your hand if you see what the profound implication of that is. The NBER and their key committee, which is called the Business Cycle Dating Committee, staffed by prestigious macroeconomists analyzing the US economy, uh, they define a recession as a significant decline in economic activity that lasts for more than a few months. More than a few, uh, which means more than two. Two is a few. One is one. Two is a few. It has to last for some period of time. You see what the implication is? The implication, some of you are mentioning this in chat, the implication is that the NBER has to wait until it gets enough data on real GDP, on real income, on employment, on industrial production, on, on sales before it declares a recession. And then it declares a recession from in the past. Right. So it waits for months, it waits for months until it gets a robust signal and a decline in most of these five variables nationwide across all sectors. That means the recession is already underway and the NBER has not yet declared it. That may in fact be happening today. Right? Recall that I mentioned real GDP, the latest real GDP numbers we have are from the first quarter of 2022. That first quarter ended in March. Or New York City was snowing here, okay? And the U.S. economy has been buffeted by some shocks since then. The U.S. economy may be in recession right now, but the NBER is waiting until it has enough months to declare that a recession has started. Okay. Uh, and so very often what happens is the, re the recession is underway and six months later, the NBER eventually declares that the recession started six months before, okay? Um, and that means the timing of these declarations, right? Uh, are necessarily affected by the very definition of a recession. And this, uh, this uh, rule here, it seems like a reasonable rule. You have to, you can't declare a recession every week, every month. You have to wait around and some, until something is kind of more long lasting. But that then has an implication that the NBR won't declare recessions until they're well underway. And that may in fact be happening today. So we're here, and if you if I highlight this, I don't know, I'll blow this up a bit. You can see at the tail end of this, you can see the fall off. You see? Okay. There is a fall off in the end from trend. And it's not necessarily the case that every fall off from trend is recessionary. It will lead to a recession, but it's possible. And that's exactly where we are today. And it's exactly where the definition of the NBR's recession uh, puts us, all right? We're uncertain right now, all right? Whether the US economy is in recession or it started several months ago. All right. Um, I think, you know, at this point, I want to take, uh, I want to take a 10 minute break at this point. Um, and just to, you know, I've, uh, I've been talking and you've been listening for, um, well, quite some time. Uh, and so I'm going to take a 10 minute break. Uh, so I have, uh, uh, what do I have here? 251 right now. Uh, we'll come back at, 
the, what is it, 301. I'll keep the meeting open. You can do whatever you want. Please keep your uh, audio and video off so we can say bandwidth and there's not something crazy going on here. Uh, and we'll take a 10 minute break. Uh, I'm gonna make a double espresso for myself. That's back in my kitchen over here. I have a espresso machine. Uh, and then uh, we'll resume at 301 and go to the, and go to 4:30. Okay. Uh, see you in uh, see you in about uh, in about 10 minutes.
Okay, uh, just give me a heads up. Uh, uh, you know, do we have an uh, audio back? Because I was charging my charging my ear uh, AirPods here. I do. Yeah, I can hear. You hear me? Okay, good. Good. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> Alrighty. So. Um, I somehow have this uh, back to where we were already. So then, um, I want to talk a little bit about uh, the one of the key uh, resources, uh, the labor resource, and its use uh, uh, over time is measured by the unemployment rate in the U.S. economy. And that's given on this next slide here. Uh, the U.S. unemployment rate in June of 2022 um, was, uh, and that's six weeks ago, recall, uh, was 3.6%. Uh, uh, and that, of course, is right here. Uh, it's generally thought of as, uh, as being a, a one of the lowest. And you can see, if we take that across, it's one of the lowest unemployment rates in the last 50 years. Right, if not the lowest in the last 50 years. Uh, that's excellent unemployment performance in the labor market as of June, uh, but things have happened since June, okay? Uh, in fact, this is uh, in the week of the 12th of June, so the week, June 12th was actually six weeks ago, okay? Uh, and uh, uh, while things were good, rosy six weeks ago, uh, perhaps they're not as, as rosy today. You can see a couple of uh, features of the unemployment rate on this uh, time series, the U.S. unemployment rate. First, uh, the U rate, let's call it, falls in expansions. 
here's an expansion here, right? In the 1960s, the real rate fell uh, from close to 7.5% uh, to about 4%. And this expansion, it fell, 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 fell in every expansion. And of course, the COVID, uh, in COVID, the unemployment rate in April 2020 was 14.9% and it's now 3.6% uh, uh, as of June. Okay. It also means uh, I, uh, that, um, not that one, uh, that uh, the U rate rises in recessions. And you can see that in every single recession, the unemployment rate rises. And so and in COVID as well. Okay. And so the unemployment rate uh, moves with the business cycle. When things are recovering, it's good for the labor market. Um, when, uh, when the economy is contracting, it's bad for the labor market. Okay. Um, it's generally thought uh, that the, uh, well, first of all, college graduates, I should give you this as uh, potential college graduates if you get past econ. 100B. Uh, the unemployment rate for potential uh, for college graduates is an astonishing um, 2.1%. Okay, uh, that means a labor market performance uh, uh, for people with a bachelor's degree or higher, or 25 years of age or older, is really good. Okay, um, here we are at, at 2.1%. Uh, as of June, and you can see the general band is between two and three percent. Okay, that means ex excellent labor market performance for college graduates. And as you probably know, college graduates tend to make uh, higher incomes on average uh, than uh, people with uh, less than a college education. Right? Okay, so the labor market um, performs well, both on employment and for uh, remuneration uh, for college graduates. I've mentioned before the natural rate of unemployment, U sub N, the unemployment rate itself, we'll call the U rate. The natural rate of unemployment can be thought of as the long run unemployment rate. And that is thought to be between 4% and 6%. You can see why on this chart. Here's 6% roughly. Here's 4% roughly. And Almost all of the observations under normal circumstances are between those two lines. Okay. Um, and so what happens in recession? In a recession, we see the unemployment rate rise, the U rate rises. And in the subsequent expansion and recovery, the U rate falls. This process is called mean reversion, that the U rate in recession, I can't touch, I've got a quarter of an inch I can touch. Uh, the U rate rises in recession and then comes back down in the recovery. And it comes back down within this range, this four to 6% range, almost always. Uh, a recession and then a recovery back into the range, a recession and a recovery back into the range, a recession and a recovery back into the range. That kind of range, recovery back into the range is called mean reversion, okay? That this variable comes back to its long run mean or average. It's also sometimes called the natural rate hypothesis. It seems to be a hypothesis that is pretty well borne out by this, these data that we're looking at right now. If we take the long run mean to be between four and 6%, yes, in fact, the unemployment rate does always spike up in recession, but come back down to within that range. And in fact, we're of course, uh, within that range or slightly lower than that range at the moment. Okay. Uh, so the unemployment rate exhibits what we call mean reversion or the natural rate hypothesis. In a way, uh, real GDP also exhibits mean reversion 
and the natural rate hypothesis in that in an expansion, real GDP ends up exceeding its potential and then it comes back down to its potential. In a, reco- in, a, in a recession, it falls off potential, but then comes back to its potential. So it, it real GDP also exhibits mean reversion or the natural rate hypothesis. Both of those variables have this property and they're tied to one another. How they're tied to one another will be one of the topics uh, for the short run analysis in this course. Next, uh, the capacity utilization rate. I saw a couple of comments here. It says 17.8% in June of 2022. Uh, And uh, you can see the average, the long run average is right around right around 80%, just maybe shy of 80%. We're pretty much right at that average, maybe a little bit above that average. I noticed the capacity utilization, which is the utilization of the countries, of the, of the uh, uh, capital stock used by our industries, our manufacturing industries, uh, our mines, and so on, uh, is uh, uh, the use of the capital stock the machinery and equipment in the United States. And you can see uh, in recoveries, uh, in general, the capacity utilization rate rises in recoveries. Okay. And in recessions, the capacity utilization rate dramatically falls. And in fact, if we look at the recent recessions, the capacity utilization rate falls a lot, falls by more than the U rate rises. Okay. You can see the capacity utilization rate at the global in the global financial crisis started at about what's called at 81% and fell to about 66%. That's a 14% fall in the capacity utilization rate in the global financial crisis. The unemployment rate in the global financial crisis went up by five percentage points. Okay. So the capacity utilization rate fell by almost three times as much. That is the capital stock of the country. Okay. In recent recessions, does more adjustment right, or experiences a bigger recession, if you will, uh, when there's a recession, when compared to the labor force. Capital, in a way, takes a bigger hit in recessions uh, than the labor force does, at least in percentage terms, okay? Next, um, the inflation rate, okay? Uh, The inflation rate, recall, is the percentage change. U.S. inflation is usually U.S. CPI inflation is equal to the percentage change in the CPI, which is the percentage change in the consumer price index from June of 2021 to June of 2022, that change, percentage change was 9% right here. Okay. Um, That's the highest on record, all right, going back to 1981, so 40 40 years. Uh, A couple of other features about Uh, the inflation rate as measured by the CPI. Um, Ignore, well, ignore the, this, this period here, just after the, uh, the post-World War uh, II period, starting in the, say, the 1960s, you can see a a definite pattern in U.S. inflation. It was low in much of the 19, for the first part of the 1960s, and then increased dramatically, right? up to the end of the 1970s and early 1980s. Look here, okay. In uh, 1980, uh, inflation was running at an uh, an astonishing 14%. We're almost there now. We're at 9% now, okay? Uh, But inflation in 1980 was around 14%. Since then, inflation has turned around and come back down until, of course, the current spike up. This period here, maybe a different, uh, I've got to turn that off somehow. This period here, let's give it a different color, 
where inflation fell and stayed low from, from the mid 1980s until 2021. This period is sometimes called the great moderation. That for some reason, okay, uh, the inflation rate came down from very high levels in the early 1980s to a low level and has stayed there for uh, almost 40 years until just the last year. And that's known as the great moderation. It's exhibited in the United States and U.S. policymakers, particularly U.S. monetary policymakers, such as the Federal Reserve, like to pat themselves on the back and say, well, you know, we have uh, understand monetary policy better uh, than we understood pol monetary policy in the 1960s and 70s. We're smarter. We have more experience. We have more academic knowledge. We know the contents of this course, okay, which you will soon learn. And we're doing monetary policy much better. And we have been successful in keeping inflation low and stable. Uh, my response to that is, well, uh, maybe you just got lucky and you haven't and you're not performing that well right now. OK, it might be the case that instead of uh, doing good monetary policy, um, this period of the great moderation was a period in which the inflationary shocks that were hitting the U.S. economy were relatively small and easily offset. Okay, relatively small and easily offset. That we just, in, in other words, it's a possibility that the U.S. economy just got lucky okay, in this 40-year period. And now we're returning to a period uh, with higher inflation. Okay? Uh, I should mention that the great moderation is also experienced in other countries, okay? in Europe, in Japan, Great Britain, uh, throughout uh, uh, Asia, Africa, Latin America, inflation rates have all come down since the mid or late 1980s to much lower levels in those regions and much more stable levels in those regions until the last year or so. That doesn't tell us one way or another whether policymaking is better or we just got lucky because if the overall shocks to the world economy were lower, then everybody's inflation rate would be lower. Or if policymakers across, monetary policymakers across the world uh, just were doing better monetary policy, uh, it might be the case that inflation would be lower worldwide. Okay? Uh, but the great moderation is a key feature of the U.S. economy and global economy uh, and represents a period of time in which uh, inflation rates came down to low levels and were stable. And we may be exiting this little piece here, may now be an exit okay, of this uh, period of the great moderation, moving to a period of you know, greater instability uh, and higher inflation rates. That's something we'll address in this course. Um, we mentioned the federal funds rate. Okay, earlier, and we uh, talked about that in some detail. The federal funds rate uh, is uh, what, what we'll have here is the target rate for the federal funds rate set by the U.S. Federal Reserve rate, uh, Federal Reserve Bank. The Federal Reserve Bank is, of course, the government bank, and it wants the federal funds rate all right in and around uh, one. We said it's one point eight percent. The federal funds rate target is a uh, one and a half, uh, one. Um, 1.05 to two, I'm sorry, 2% uh, or 150 basis points uh, to 200 basis points. And of course, 158 is right at the lower end of this range. And you can see also, well, let me ask you, do you see something going on here? All right. With this time series, this is the federal funds rate going back to uh, uh, just before the 1960s. Do you see a pattern here? Yeah, there's a pattern here. And this pattern we would call again, the great moderation. We saw the great moderation on the previous slide in terms of inflation rates. This is a great moderation in interest rates. In uh, the interest rate that we call the Fed funds rate. The 
overnight interbank lending rate. You can see the same exact pattern as, as on the previous slide. In the 1960s, the Fed funds rate was low. It gradually rose to a very high level. Notice here, the federal funds rate was an astonishing 22% in 1980, um, just after 1980, 1981. Now, that means the overnight interbank lending rate was 22%. Banks were charging one another 22% on overnight loans. Okay, That has since come down. Notice the same pattern until recently. And so we again have this time a great moderation in this key interest rate. Other countries have equivalent interest, uh, interest rates that are equivalent to the federal funds, right? An overnight interbank lending rate. And other countries' overnight interbank, uh, interbank lending rates also exhibit this great moderation and then the possible exit of the great moderation okay, as their policy interest rates start rising okay, in the last year. Uh, this is a close-up shot of the federal funds rate, just going back to about 2001. Okay. And uh, there is a pattern here. This is the Fed funds rate. It is monitored by the U.S. Central Bank, and the U.S. Central Bank can take actions which can move this federal funds rate around. Um, and if you look at this time series graph, recall this is the global financial crisis. This is COVID. And this is the downturn in 2001. Do you see the pattern here? The pattern is the following. A high federal funds rate leads to a subsequent recession. A rising and high federal funds rate leads to a subsequent recession. A rising and high federal funds rate, well, this is COVID, so we're not quite sure, but there is a recession afterwards. And look what's happening now. We have a rising Fed funds rate. This behavior, which is a policy undertaken by the Federal Reserve Bank. Okay. Recent experience seems to indicate that if this continues, and it's likely to, to continue as the Federal Reserve has indicated, it will likely indicate, it will likely raise the federal funds target, move this target up by 75 basis points or 100 basis points um, in its next meeting, and possibly by as much as two or two and a half, uh, um, uh, 200 basis points or 250 basis points by the end of the year. If that continues, recent history indicates that that would possibly lead to a recession, okay? A recession caused by the Federal Reserve Bank, okay? Um, and that topic is also something we'll address uh, towards the latter part of the, towards the latter part of the course. Okay. Uh, if you want to learn more about uh, the U.S. economy and, and uh, take a look at uh, graphs on unemployment, unemployment for college graduates, unemployment for high school graduates, uh, unemployment for those without a high school degree, and all the other data I've indicated, the, all these graphs were generated at the Federal Reserve's website called FRED. If you Google that, if you Google FRED uh, and economic data, you'll go to the first link, the first uh, uh, result will go to this data. You can open these up and generate uh, uh, these kinds of graphs, just as I have over the last uh, hour or so. All right. Uh, and you can learn a lot about the U.S. economy. Here is the, uh, here's the link to the website. Okay. Uh, what I want to do now is uh, start to turn our attention to the formal part of the more formal part of the course, uh, the analytic part of the course. So far, we've been discussing data, uh, and I want to move on towards uh, discussing uh, economic analysis. And so I'm going to uh, close this out um, keep that, and move over to another set of slides. Okay. And this other set of slides here, you see this is my math review. It is, uh, it should be on the, this is not bright space, this is a canvas here. Right space is something we use here at NYU. This is Canvas. Okay. Um, 
Just as part of the math review, uh, uh, there's a handout on uh, Canvas um, that takes you through the various um, rules of calculus that we, uh, we need. We need to use the power rule, the product rule, the quotient rule, the chain rule, the log differentiation rule, remember that? That's given here. The exponential rule and, of course, partial differentiation. Uh, the TAs and discussion sections uh, this week uh, will review uh, uh, some of these rules in the context of uh, economic, uh, economic analysis. I hope you practice on these. These will appear on uh, Canvas quizzes uh, this week. I just want to keep this on the slide deck uh, so you know that this is uh, part of what you're responsible for. The math review that's posted on Canvas uh, goes into much greater detail, and the discussion problem set that is posted on Canvas uh, asks you a series of questions to use these uh, rules of the calculus uh, uh, to obtain uh, answers. Okay. Um, having said that, I want to start turning our attention to the topic of economic growth. Okay. Um, Economic growth is the topic of chapter eight, nine, and 10 in our textbook. It was the first main topic we'll talk about. Uh, and uh, Robert Lucas, uh, a noted uh, uh, a Nobel Prize winning macroeconomist at the University of Chicago, uh, is famous for having said that once you start thinking about economic growth, it is difficult to think about anything else. Well, uh, well, with all due respect to Mr. Uh, Lucas, Professor Lucas, uh, he's an economist. Most people would say, once you start thinking about pizza, uh, it's difficult to think about anything else. But his point is the following, uh, that economic growth, once you start understanding the process of economic growth and the consequences of economic growth, uh, that um, this overwhelms almost any other macroeconomic consideration. Okay, it, it's much a much larger issue in people's lives, and yet it doesn't get attention in uh, the business press, uh, in uh, the commentariat uh, regarding uh, the effects on people's well-being and their uh, standard of living. And so, I want to take you through that. Uh, and the first part of our course will go through uh, these three chapters on economic growth. Okay, uh, first. Um, T picking up on Lucas's claim uh, is the title of this, this next slide, is economic growth the only thing that matters? This graph is a graph of US real GDP per capita, right? So recall it's real GDP, the real production, so inflation adjusted, divided by the population of the United States. Going back to 1789. Okay. Of course, that's an estimate. We don't have real great data in that, but something in the neighborhood of uh, of a thousand dollars of real GDP per capita in uh, the nation's founding uh, in uh, 1789. Okay, and you can see the tremendous growth here. We would call this exponential growth. It's like a rocket ship taking off, okay? It's exploding out and up. And if we take a look at this uh, particular variable, okay, US real GDP per person, per capita, there are a couple of things that stand out uh, that uh, uh, reinforce Robert Lucas's uh, claim that once you start thinking about economic growth, it's the only thing that matters really. It's hard to think about anything else. One of the greatest calamities in U.S. economic history was the Great Depression. Okay. The Great Depression is on this graph. Right? The Great Depression took place in the 1930s. The unemployment rate was at least 25% in the United States. And real GDP fell dramatically. And if we look for the 1930s, that's right here. And this, well, maybe in red here, right? This is the Great Depression. Look how small it is. Okay. It was an overall short run 
economic calamity that lasted about a decade and ended as the U.S. economy moved into a war footing to fight uh, uh, fascism and Nazism uh, in the Second World War. It was overall a short period of time, and though it was a calamity, um, it's relatively small on this graph. Look at how many... Uh, Look how many grid marks are on this graph. We start here. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. I am keep I keep getting interrupted by turn off these notifications. Uh, that's uh, what was it? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten grid marks. How many grid marks of the Great Depression? It looks like one half of a grid, a grid line, let's call them. All right. And the US economy has grown since the Great Depression. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine grid lines. Okay. Uh, that's an you know, that's a tremendous change, right? From ten thousand dollars per person around the uh, less than ten thousand dollars per person to more than $50,000 per person. That's a five-fold increase. People have pointed out that it, this upward sloping exponential explosive growth, like a rocket ship taking off, completely overwhelms the Great Depression. The Great Depression is small in comparison. And that's the notion that Economic growth overwhelms even the worst short-run economic calamities. Okay, as long as the growth process continues, the economy will grow its way out of calamities. There's another calamity on this graph. That's right here. I think a different color. This is the global financial crisis of December 2007. Uh, to June of 2009. And it's also one half of a grid line. Right? And as long as the US economy continues chugging along and it's long run growth, very long run growth, that too will be swamped okay, by the processes of economic growth, by growing out of that. And today, okay, it's not clear at all that that has any sub subsequent uh, real effects on the U.S. economy, or at least regarding real GDP per person. Okay? And so the key takeaway here is that economic growth is exponential, right, and it swamps short-run fluctuations. All of these short-run fluctuations are tiny, all these recessions that we saw on previous graphs are small and tiny compared to the process of economic growth. That means economic growth is ultimately the only thing that matters okay? in the long, in the very long run. Right? Business cycles, of course, and downturns matter in the short run, but not in the long run. Okay? It turns out economic growth matters even over relatively short time horizons. The time horizon on the previous slide was a, over 100, around 140 years, right? But even at small time horizons, now, let me give you an example. Uh, if the US uh, growth of real GDP per capita was just right, three tenths of a percentage higher in each year of the 1990s, in other words, for that decade, okay? Uh, just uh, three tenths is three out of this is the uh, right three over a thousand. Okay, just for those ten years, then U.S. real GDP would be about half a trillion dollars higher by the end of that decade in two thousand. U.S. real GDP would be about half a trillion dollars higher every year forever after two thousand. And to translate that to the average person, the average person would earn an extra, if you're the average person, $1,650 every year forever. If during that 10-year period of the 1990s, the, economic, the growth rate was just three-tenths of a percent higher. 
to see what's happening. Recall from the previous slide, economic growth is exponential. And so what we're saying is something like this. Here's time. Here's real GDP per person. Okay. And this is what the growth rate would have been. Here's the 1990s. Here's 1990. And here's 2000. And it wouldn't be chugging along like this. But if it was three tenths of a percent higher just in this period, it would be something a little bit higher here by the end of two, by the by the end of that decade in 2000 and then it would go back on trend and so it would always be this is tasking me it would always be half a trillion dollars higher every year forever just because the US economy grew slightly faster for this time period, okay? And so this matters a lot. I think everybody in this meeting would like to have an extra $1,600 a year for the rest of their lives. There's a lot I could do with that, a lot of espresso that I could buy with that. Okay, so um, economic growth affects uh, things besides uh, income. Economic growth also affects other measures of well-being. It's not just about money. Okay, uh, this is a chart developed by the World Bank a few years ago. Um, I think uh, 2012 or so. Um, and so it lists a bunch of rich countries, just a handful of selected rich countries, the United States, the UK, France, so on, Italy, uh, and a, a selection of representative poor countries, Pakistan, Cambodia, Sierra Leone, Niger, so on, Congo. Um, and some of their other uh, ascriptive characteristics of, of well-being in the countries, okay, such as GDP per capita, that's the first column, child mortality, life expectancy, adult literacy, and uh, the percentage of people living on less than $2 a day, utter poverty. And it indicates that if uh, you can get your average, this is GDP per capita, this is uh, real GDP over the population, this is the average income. If you can get that average from here to here, then you solve lots of problems for the country. Uh, because if you get above this level here, okay, Italy and above, uh, the under five mortality rate right, uh, is in the single digits. Think about this column here. The under five mortality rate is the number of children five years of age or less that, who die. Okay, That has to be, for any family, that has to be the greatest, uh, greatest personal uh, an emotional tragedy in their lives, right? If you live in the rich countries in the world, it hasn't eliminated that completely, but, but it's down to the single digits. But in the poor countries in the world, look at these numbers. Pakistan, back in 2012, a hundred out of a thousand children die before the age of five. Uh, in Cambodia, 140. Uh, children die at up a thousand before the age of five. In Congo, Niger, and Sierra Leone, pushing up to 300 children out of every thousand born die before the age of five. Utter tragedies for these people. If you get your average person into this region, you don't eliminate the problem, but it's in the single digits. The worst tragedies can, that can happen to families are uh, uh, severely mitigated. The next column, life expectancy. If you believe life is good, more life is better. The rich countries in the world, their average life expectancy is around 80 years of age. In the poorer countries in the world in this sample, 64 years, 58 years, Sierra Leone, 42 years. Okay. Um, you know, Sierra Leone, that's, that's a very young person in my view, right? or around my age or something like that. Right? That's, that's 
dangerously low. Adult literacy, essentially everybody in the rich world can read. They can read and write, which means they can participate in the modern economy. Okay, they can read documents, they can sign contracts, etc. In the poor parts of the world, uh, literacy rates 50%, 75%, 37%, 29%. Many of these people without being able to read or write are not going to be able to participate in a modern economy. Lastly, poverty. The World Bank in Washington, D.C., um, declares, uh, sets a, a standard for utter grinding poverty. It says in any country in the world, if a person lives on less than $2 a day, they are utterly, absolutely grindingly poor. In the rich countries in the world, nobody is that poor. It turns out I live in New York City here in lower Manhattan. I live in a, a, a neighborhood that's close to what's called the Bowery, uh, uh, right near NYU. Uh, and the Bowery used to be what we call Skid Row and the down and out people, really hard on their luck, really difficult lives. Um, but even, even the people on the street uh, here on the Bowery uh, are living on more than $2 a day. Uh, the cots they sleep in and the various Bowery missions, uh, the food they eat, is certainly more than $2 a day. Okay. Nobody in the rich world lives on less than $2 a day, but in the poorest countries in the world, right, 50, 60, 85% of the population live in utter grinding poverty. If you can get the average of average person, the average is the middle class, right? That's the middle. If you can improve the lot of the middle class, you can eliminate grinding poverty. It doesn't mean there's not poverty but you can eliminate grinding poverty by moving the middle up, okay? That's a way of an interpret, politically interpreting uh, this last column of this chart. Improvements in the middle of the distribution, the average, the middle class, right, will pull people up out of grinding poverty, will have consequences that pull people up out of grinding poverty. This graph I, I, I love, this is from uh, Angus Madison. Uh, which is a graph of, again, uh, real GDP per capita uh, in 1990 dollars, going back to uh, uh, the beginning of the current era, right? Um, and these are clearly estimates. Uh, Mang Angus Madison and his, uh, his research team uh, estimated uh, real GDP going back uh, uh, to uh, the beginning of the current era. Um, and you can see by their estimates, Everybody used to be grindingly poor, okay? And that was true all through the Middle Ages, right? Until, right, uh, the 18th, uh, beginning of the, of, the, of the middle of the 18th century and the 19th century when some countries and regions started breaking away. Right? They started and stepped on the, on the up escalator of exponential growth. Okay. But our default as a species, and this, and this graph goes this way, it's flat all the way back uh, for all time. Okay. We weren't, there wasn't some golden age uh, 200,000 years ago when we, we all had cell phones, right? We were always, as a species, we were always grindingly poor and on the cusp of starvation and utter grinding poverty until right in here. And then in Western Europe, in the United States, in the so-called offshoots, okay, uh, they pulled away. They rapidly grew. Okay? And now other regions and other countries in the world are starting to grow as well, starting to get out of grinding poverty. Okay? That's, a, in some sense, a, a miracle. Okay? Another way of saying this is, uh, back when we were really poor, we were also more equal. Everybody was equal back then. We we're all we're all starving, okay. And uh, then there was a separation, okay. And there was a great now a great deal of income inequality, okay, because some countries got rich, and other countries are laggards, are not getting rich, not yet, but they're moving, okay, and that's encouraging. Um, there are growth miracles, but also growth disasters. Clearly, the United States, uh, going back to 
the last centuries uh, is a growth miracle. Japan as well. Okay, South Korea has taken off. Uh, but then there are countries like Argentina. Look at poor Argentina. Uh, Argentina back in the 1930s, 20s and 30s, was nearly as rich as the United States, just a, a, a shade uh, poorer than the United States and certainly richer than uh, Japan, uh, uh, South Korea and, and uh, Nigeria. And today, uh, Argentina hasn't grown that much. And today, um, uh, the United States is richer, but so is uh, Japan and South Korea and many other countries. Back in the 1930s, Argentina was the seventh uh, highest and the seventh highest uh, real GDP per person. Now, South Korea ranks 85th. Other countries have blown it out of the water. Why? What happened? Uh, Whatever Argentina did, uh, don't do that, okay? That's a bad example. And it comes down to macroeconomic policy that affects economic growth over the time frame from 1930 to today, over the time frame of 30, 50, 100 years, over uh, uh, the very long run. Um, there are also these growth disasters. Uh, here's a, another chart uh, indicates. I mentioned Singapore uh, was the world's had the world's highest uh, real GDP per capita, uh, well above the United States. Right here's the U.S., uh, but you can see uh, some uh, countries here, uh, such as I guess uh, difficult to see uh, that there. Uh, the United United Kingdom, South Korea, they're well above the world average. The world average is here at about. $20,000 per person per year in 2011 dollars. Okay. Uh, that would be about $30,000 today. Okay. Um, and then you can see countries kind of right in the middle, right around the world average. This is going back only to 2016. China is undoubtedly higher than the world average today, but not much higher than the world average today in 2022. In income per person, they have a very high GDP, but they also have a lot of people. Okay, so remember the denominator is big. All right, if you're looking at a GDP over the number of population in, in China, the population, the denominator is large, and that keeps real GDP per person relatively low in China. China and Brazil are what you'd call middle income countries. They're in the middle of the income distribution. The United States, uh, Singapore, UK, uh, South Korea, Italy are high income countries and countries here uh, uh, are lower income uh, countries okay, or low income countries. Uh, if we blow up those low income countries, here's China, remember, in the middle. Just uh, at or slightly above the world average, uh, but you can see there are also growth effects, uh, growth effects. Uh, uh, miracles taking place in the lower group. Uh, uh, India and Vietnam, and to a lesser extent, uh, Guyana, are moving up uh, rapidly. Uh, but then there are also uh, growth disasters here. Okay? Um, and so the takeaway from these two slides is uh, there are some countries that seem to be trapped, right? Uh, in low income levels. There are other countries like Argentina that were rich and have not maintained uh, their relative uh, richness. And there are other countries that are growth miracles. Okay, why is that? Uh, it means a couple of things. First, that uh, growth is not automatic. Growth has to do with the country's experience and particularly macroeconomic policy that will affect the process of economic growth. And if you do macroeconomic policy wrong, like Argentina has uh, since the 1930s, uh, then uh, your people will suffer for it because their income per person, their average income will stagnate and not keep up with the rest of the world and they'll be relatively poor, okay? But if you do follow policies such as China, India, Vietnam, South Korea, et cetera, Okay, uh, you can perform a growth miracle on your country and move up the income per person, uh, average income of your middle class. Okay, which, as we've seen on the on the table earlier table, will uh, eliminate poverty, reduce child mortality, increase life expectancy, uh, increase uh, 
um, education attainment and, and uh, adult literacy and move your economy towards uh, being able to adapt to a modern uh, global economy. Right? It turns out some of the some of the points I've just made can be uh, starkly um, uh, presented uh, in the following in the following way uh, that uh, growth is actually good for the poor. Okay. Uh, this claim, okay, which when it was first made uh, by two economists, uh, Dollar and Cray at the World Bank, they did a study in 2001 uh, that was so astonishing uh, that it was so widely, uh, widely, dis widely discussed at the time. Uh, they waited 15 years, and then they redid the study with a, another set of data, a, a, a wider set of, of course, uh, observations and a wider data set, and the data uh, the study in 2016 reproduced uh, their uh, their earlier findings uh, that when the middle class grows, okay, the bottom of the income distribution in the country also grows, and it grows faster than the middle grows. In other words, the income distribution tightens up. Okay, the way they present this data is on this chart here. Let's see if I can bring this up a bit. Um, I want to look at the horizontal and the vertical axes here, and then we'll talk about the scatter plots, these blue dots, and the regression line that's running in between them. First, uh, this is on the bottom here, you can see this is the logarithm of per capita income. So this is uh, real GDP, what we've been calling Y or real GDP, divided by the population, divided by the population. And then on this, we take the log. The logarithm doesn't uh, do anything to this distribution. It just makes, uh, makes it easier to present the data. That's all. Um, so this is the average, the log average of income in a country. And each of these dots is a particular country. Okay. Um, this axis is also the log per capita income in uh, the poorest quintile. A quintile is the poor, the lowest quintile or poorest quintile is the poorest 20% of the population of a country. And this represents the log real GDP in that quintile, the lowest 20%. And you'll notice two things about this. This graph, these are the scatter plots of all these almost 200 countries, this scatter plot, we drew a line, an eyeball line through kind of the center of all these points. We would generate what's called a regression line. Those of you who've taken econometrics uh, will learn the tools that will generate the formula for that regression line. It's also sometimes called the best fit line. It's also called the eyeball line. That if you ask people to draw a line between kind of the middle of all these points, they will uh, on average draw out of this line with the same slope and intercept that is generated by uh, statistical processes uh, that you learn in econometrics. Okay. And what this upward slope means is the following. Okay, the, this upward slope means the following. As the average income increases, the average income is the income of the middle. So think of it as, as, as the income of the middle class increases, the income of the poorest 20% also increases. The real GDP, the average income of the poorest 20% also rises. So when the middle class improves, the bottom also improves. Okay. So the entire distribution is moving up, not just the middle, but the bottom too. And the second piece comes from the formula in the middle of this chart, which you might not be able to see on your slides. It comes from this particular coefficient. I'll write it out here. One couple of digits, 1.07, that's the slope. 
And the way to interpret that slope is the following. It says, if there's a 1%, uh, I'll, I'll interpret it this way for you. If there's a 1% increase in the average income of the middle class, there's a 1.7% increase in the average income of the lowest 25, uh, 20%. That is, if the middle increases by 1%, the average income of the poorest 20% increases by 1.7% more. That means the bottom of the distribution, the middle and the bottom of both moving, increasing, but the bottom is actually moving by more which means the income distribution, at least in that part of the, of the graph, is tightening. That growth is better for the poor than it is for the middle. If the middle increases by 1%, the income of the poorest 20% increases by 1.07%. And so what we're, we're saying is the following, if we think of a distribution like this, it doesn't have to be a bell curve, but it turns out it's close to being a bell curve. And here's the middle, right? right. And this is a real GDP over the population. Right? And this is the percentage of people. And if you move this by 1%, the bottom moves by more than 1%. I'm sorry, I drew that curve a little poorly. Let me just take that away. Then the middle moves by more than 1%. There's the middle. So this middle has moved by 1%, but the bottom moves by greater than 1%. And so growth is actually good for the bottom of the income distribution. Okay. Dollar and Crane, the authors of this study, found this in 2001. Uh, it garnered a lot of attention and controversy. They waited 15 years, collected more data, redid the study, found the same thing. Okay, that supported uh, their original, uh, their original um, uh, uh, hypothesis, right? That growth is good uh, for the poor. Okay. All right. Um, so I want to start introducing the tools and model of uh, economic growth. And this is, uh, starts us off in chapter eight, uh, uh, economic growth part one. This is the very long run, as we've mentioned, 30 to 100 years. Okay. Um, most macroeconomic variables grow over this time frame, And so we could write a variable as Y, this would be real GDP as a function of time. And we could write it like this, right? Y is some function of T, okay? Um, and if that's the case, uh, then we wanna know how, what the growth rate of Y is, okay? How fast does this variable Y grow over time? We need some notation for this. Now you might <laughs> notice, I think, mean, question? No? Somebody's got their mic on, all right. Um, uh, you might notice there's a good deal of notation has been introduced today. Uh, potential, uh, a real potential output YP, um, unemployment, the U rate, uh, the natural rate of unemployment, U sub N and so on. Um, this is important notation here. Uh, it makes your notes cleaner. You have to understand what it is. The growth rate of Y will be this symbol defined. Remember three bars is a definition. G sub Y, right? the G stands for growth. And the subscript stands for the variable, uh, the variable whose growth rate we're looking at. So this term g sub y can be thought of as the time derivative of, of y divided by y. The numerator of this expression, or the, the derivative of y with respect to time, tells us how much y changes over a small increment in time. That's the numerator. Divided by y itself tells us the growth rate. So if a variable starts at 100, at right, the beginning of the year and ends up at 107 at the end of the year, uh, then it's 
increase over time has been seven as a fraction of the original 100 is seven over 100 or 7%. That's the growth rate of the variable. This is how you would do it in the calculus. Okay. Um, writing this out as dy dt all over y is tedious. Okay. Uh, and the calculus has been, uh, uh, the notation has been invented uh, to save on some writing. And this is now this, the, determined as, a, as a, a simple way of writing dy dt as y dot over, uh, uh, as y dot. So the, the derivative of x with respect to t would be x dot. The derivative of a variable z with respect to t would be z dot. Okay, those dots are the time derivatives. That's in the numerator, and then we divide by one. Okay, that's also a way of writing the growth rate of the variable y. All right. Next, uh, we could have uh, instead of the calculus, we could have a change in the variable. The change in y is a, a fraction of itself, or we could say simply that the uh, the percentage change in y is equal to the growth rate of y. These are Right, several different ways of writing the growth rate of y. G sub y, the derivative of y with respect to t, y dot over y, delta y over y, or the percentage change in y. All of them mean the same thing. They mean the growth rate of the variable y that we might be interested in, the growth rate of, say, real GDP. Let me give you an example here. Suppose we have a variable a that we're interested in and A grows over time. Okay. And the way A is constructed is that uh, A is the result of the product of B and C. So A is equal to B times C. Okay. And we may not be necessarily interested in the level of A, we're interested in rather how A grows, the growth rate of A. If that's the case, then the growth rate of A, using this notation here, the growth rate of A is equal to the growth rate of B plus this product becomes a plus sign in growth rates. It's the growth rate of B plus the growth rate of C. You see the little trick here? This is a very, very useful, uh, very useful tool. If you have a variable that's created by a product, that variable will grow by the sum of the growth rates. Uh, the way we can say that is the growth rate of the product is the sum of the growth rates. You add up the growth rates and that add the growth rate of A to the growth rate of, I'm sorry, the growth rate of B to the growth rate of C and you'll get the growth rate of A. So for example, suppose we know that the growth rate of B is 3%, that's here. And the growth rate of C is 4%, that's here. We add the two of them and we get the growth rate of A is 7%. Easy. Easy. Notice the trick. A product becomes a sum in growth rates. Okay. So far, so good. Next little trick. Okay. Uh, you could, uh, just before I get to that next trick, uh, if you want to do this mathematically correct, good luck to you. The way you would do it is you would take the natural logarithm of both sides of this expression and then differentiate that natural logarithm with respect to time, okay? You can do that and it will take you hmm, two, uh, four lines of algebra and some differentiation with respect to the logarithm to do that. It's much easier to remember this trick, okay? This one. Next, suppose we have a variable E that we're interested in. Uh, and it's equal to f squared. Take a, a moment and tell me what the growth rate of E is. Someone pop that into chat. Yeah, that's right. That's right. Someone, if you look at your book at chat, uh, uh, we have an answer. The growth rate of E is not 2f. It's equal to, right? You got to be careful and remember the notation, right? It's equal to two times the growth rate of F. 
not 2F, but two times the growth rate of F. To see why this is, this is the answer. To see why this is, remember what F squared is. F squared is F times F, right? And now we have a product. And we know products become sums in growth rates. And so if we look at the growth rate of E, it must be the growth rate of F, the first one, plus the growth rate of F again, which is two times the growth rate of F. Be careful for that notation, okay? So far, so good. What this means, look at where the two comes from. The two is here and it came from the exponent. We didn't differentiate this, we just used the trick, okay? The way to formalize and write out in words this growth trick is to say the following. If the variable starts with an exponent, that expo exponent becomes the coefficient in, in growth rates. That exponent of two becomes the coefficient in terms of the growth rates. That's the second trick. Next. Oh, well, we'll do this example. Someone write out for me the growth rate of Z. I'm gonna take a little break here. In chat, I put the answer in chat. Remember the growth notation. Are people paying attention to chat? We got Alexander here, let's see. Alexander says it's two times the growth rate of X plus one time one third times the growth rate of, of Y, and that is correct. Okay, good to go. All right, so here we have notice two things that are going on. Here's the plus, here's the product that generates the plus sign. The exponent on X becomes the growth the coefficient on the growth rate of X. The exponent on Y becomes the coefficient on the growth rate of Y, okay? You could take the natural logarithm of this expression for Z, using the rules of natural logarithm, separate things out, and then take the time derivative of that. <laughs> Have fun with that. Or you can remember the growth trick. Let's take an example here. Look at example four. Theta is equal to m cubed divided by n to the one third. What is the growth rate of theta? In other words, what is this variable? In chat, do people have it? What do you think about division? What do people think about division? Yes, division. If addition generates, I'm sorry, if multiplication generates an addition in growth rates, then division must generate a minus sign. That's right, Luke. KD, right. right? Do you see that? So here's the division right here. And then the growth rate, that division becomes a minus sign. And then we know the exponents end up as coefficients on the growth rates, All right? And so that's then the growth rate of theta, okay? Product in the original function becomes a plus sign in growth rates. Division in the original function becomes a subtraction in growth rates. Very good. One way of saying that is quotients become differences in growth rates, okay? That's the rule in words. Let's see if we can do this backwards, okay? You know what I mean by backwards? If I give you the growth rates, can you go back up and get right the primitive function? That's right, in your head. So suppose I give you this example, the growth rate of H is equal to seven times the growth rate of small r minus two thirds times the growth rate of S. What was the original function H? Tell me, tell me in growth rates. I'm sorry, tell me, tell me what H is in chat. Uh, sorry, I lost my mind there. 
Does anyone have it? Mm. We have an answer in chat. The answer in chat, uh, careful for the, for the G's there. You careful for the G's area. Not quite, that's not quite right. Get the notation right. Yeah, yeah, that's, it. that's right. Luke, let's see, Luke has an answer there. Uh, Luke has H is equal to small, it's small r, Dasan. Uh, small r to the seventh power divided by S to the two thirds. That is correct. Uh, most of you had uh, people who were answered here got the right thing, except for Zakai got it right. Okay. Uh, got to be careful for the notation though. And so here's the answer. Okay. H is equal to small r to the seventh, right? Divided by S to the two thirds. Okay. Or you could write it like this small r to the seventh times S to the minus two thirds, right? Same. You know what you just did? Arian, I mentioned in the chat, what you just did is you integrated that function right, in your head using a trick. Okay. Remember how when you took the calculus, how difficult integration was? Right? You had to really sit down and crank it out, add one to the exponent, divide by. Now you're doing all of that in your head in 10 seconds or something. Right. In a way, uh, if you use the growth trick, you have to log things and then differentiate with respect to time. If you go backwards, you integrate with respect to time in logarithmic terms. Okay, You just did all of this in your head by using these growth tricks. Hang on to these growth tricks. Practice these growth tricks. There'll be some questions on the quiz uh, this week, uh, the uh, uh, Canvas quiz on these growth tricks use them they're very useful to be able to break down the variables we're studying into their subsequent parts why does what uh, how does real gdp change it's because and grow it's because labor is growing because capital is growing because technology is growing and we can put them together in uh, certain ways depending upon the formula we have uh, for how gdp is produced okay very good thank you that was very nicely done so I want to give you the first uh, uh, insights economists and really anybody in world history has ever had about the processes of economic growth. Uh, this is insights uh, uh, generated by Nicholas Caldor in the 1940s and 50s and his research team. Um, the first uh, true uh, uh, analysis of economic growth in world history. Um, and him and his, his team uh, came up with some theoretical and empirical or data-driven results that must hold for any growth model, okay? It's kind of like, these are the facts that you have to explain in any growth model. And I'm going to put them here and they're going to be overwhelming to you uh, for the moment. There's, depending upon you, how you count, six or seven of them. Uh, and they're complicated. I'm just going to throw them all out at you. And believe it or not, by the end of this section, you will be able to derive all of these results. They're called the Caldor great ratios uh, because each one of them is a, a ratio or a fraction. Okay, uh, and uh, these are the, in, in some sense, the the theory and empirics that imply the great ratios of, uh, of below must hold. Okay, all of these six or seven, really. There's uh, number four. There's two. Uh, these must must obtain in any model that's produced because this is how the world looks. And I'm just going to read them and I'm not going to do any analysis here. First, uh, output per worker, which we'll label as real GDP Y over L grows at a roughly constant rate. The second is the capital per worker. Remember, K, capital stock is capital K. Capital per worker is K over L. That also grows at a roughly constant rate. Third, the capital output ratio, K over Y, is roughly constant. And it turns out, and you can do this in the privacy of your own home later tonight, it turns out um, one, two, and three, which must hold in any, in any model of, uh, of economic growth, one, two, and three together imply that the growth rates of Y over L and K over L must themselves be the same, must be equal. Okay? Four, uh, 
The fourth Keldo great ratio, which is really two of them, says the share of GDP paid to labor, which is that expression. I'm not going to talk about it right now. We'll talk about it later. And the share of GDP paid to capital are roughly constant. They're not the same constant, but they're roughly constant. Um, five, the return to capital is roughly constant. And the real wage or the, uh, the wage adjusted for prices and inflation grows at the same rate as y over l okay like i said i'm not explaining these uh, i'm just saying that back in the 1940s and 50s nicholas caldor and his research team discovered these facts of economic growth and that any model of economic growth must do these six things and as a speaking personally as a as a research economist i look at this and uh, it's a daunting task. Your model has to do all six of these at the same time. How, how do you build that? Well, it turns out somebody did, okay? And that somebody is a pure genius. His name is Robert Solo, okay? He's a Nobel Prize winning economist. He's 96 years old. He's at the university uh, at MIT. He's been at MIT for the last 60 years. Uh, and he's a product of New York City here in New York City. He went to uh, public high school in Sheepshead Bay. Um, and he sat down in the way he saw Caldor's, he, he, he saw Caldor's great ratios. He knew he had to do, do these things. And he said, well, okay, hold my beer. I'm going to do this. And he did. And the model he generated is known as the solo growth model. It is probably the most respected and uh, uh, most honored uh, economic model we've got, okay? It says lots of things about the world, some of them intuitive and some not intuitive and shocking, okay? And, and well, not maybe shocking, but surprising, okay? And it's the basic model of economics, uh, economic growth. And, and that's where we turn our attention right now. Chapter eight, in some sense, is uh, the solo model from his 1956 paper. It's really part one of that paper. It's a model in which he does not allow technology to change. It's a model with no technological change. Okay. Uh, as you can guess, right? Uh, his 1956 paper has part one with no technological change. Part two has technological change. Okay. Part two, technological change, is chapter nine. Okay, All right. So that's where we're headed. Now, um, Robert Solo is much smarter than you. He's much smarter than me. He's much smarter than anybody. Now, you might ask yourself why technology we know is very important for our world. Why would he start with a model without technological change? Okay. All right. Well, he's smart. And what he does is he shows that if you don't have technological change, then first, you can't explain Caldor's great ratios, right? But more importantly, he shows if you ignore technological change, then you can't explain the key features of our world. So he builds a model of economic growth. And we'll do that, all right, uh, starting now and finishing on Thursday. He builds a model of economic growth without technology technological change. And then he shows that that can't be our world and that model cannot explain the Caldor great ratios. Therefore, techno technological change is the key to our world. Therefore, technological change is the key to all of the Caldor great ratios. So he leaves the key thing out. You see his logic? He leaves the key thing out and shows you Without that key thing, you don't have our world. That highlights the importance of technological progress. Okay. So setting up this model of technological change, uh, of, of economic growth without technological change, the solo model without technological change. First, he starts with what's called the aggregate production function. The word aggregate means the total production function. So the way he's conceiving of this is that this is the way Real GDP, this is Y, this is real GDP here. K is capital. L is labor. 
Those are the two key inputs. There's no other inputs, capital and labor, and there's no technology. Okay. These get combined in one big nationwide factory, if you think. That's the capital F for factory. And then they make GDP. You take a bunch of labor, a bunch of workers, combine that with machinery and equipment, that's capital, no other technology, and that becomes um, real GDP. Uh, so Y is real GDP or output, K is capital, L is labor. The properties of the pro aggregate production function are two and they're important. Okay? The first is that this Y function, this F function has constant returns to scale, CRTS. Okay? We'll talk about that. Uh, what constant returns to scale means is the following. When all inputs change by a proportion, say a proportion lambda, then output changes by the same proportion lambda. So if uh, the capital stock increases by 10% and the labor force increases by 10%, then together output will increase, putting them together, output will increase by exactly 10%. Okay, that's constant returns to scale. Okay, the production function solo adopts has constant returns to scale. The second feature of this aggregate production function is diminishing marginal product of capital and labor. Okay? What we mean by that is that any input's contribution to production falls as more of that input is used, holding all other inputs constant. So if you're holding labor constant and you're just adding more and more machinery to a given factory, there's going to get crowding in that factory. There's more and more machines coming in. Okay? And that extra crowding okay, will limit those machines' productivity, will reduce the productivity, the marginal productivity of those machines. Or taking labor, if you've got a, a fixed number of machines, and you add more workers to work on the same number of machines, the workers will crowd around the machinery. And as crowding takes place, workers will get in one another's way and the additional workers will contribute less and less production because there's crowding. Not because anything's wrong with those workers, it's just the machinery is getting crowded. The machines are fixed and you're adding more workers. That's diminishing marginal product of capital and labor and the production function, the aggregate production function that Solo adopts has both of these features, constant returns to scale and diminishing marginal productivity of capital and labor. So we want to talk about those in a more analytic fashion. Okay? Regarding constant returns to scale, here's the production function, the aggregate production function, real GDP Y is equal to some function of K and L, and F has to have constant returns to scale. If all inputs change by a proportion lambda, and output changes by that same proportion lambda. Okay. Uh, so what we'll do is we'll multiply K and L by lambda. So instead of K, we now have lambda times K. And instead of L, we now have lambda times L. Then we must have the following. Inside here, we no longer have K, but we have lambda K. Inside of here, we no longer have L, but lambda times L. Okay. Next, okay, under constant returns to scale, right, under CRTS, we have to have a lambda times y. Okay, if you've done this, multiply k by lambda, multiply l by lambda, then you must on the outside have y multiplied by lambda. That's this very definition here of constant returns to scale. Okay. So one way of saying that is if you double all the inputs, in this case, lambda would be two, then output would double. The implication for this is the following. Constant returns to scale implies that size does not matter for economic growth, okay? That's actually important, okay? Because if you don't have constant returns to scale, then size will matter for economic growth. The alternatives to constant returns to scale are increasing returns to scale or decreasing returns to scale. So for instance, 
with constant returns to scale, big and small countries can grow fast or slow. It doesn't depend upon the returns to scale. That doesn't matter. The size of the country doesn't matter. But if you had increasing returns to scale, I, IRTS, then it would be the case that only large countries would grow fast. Okay. And that we don't see that in the data. Many fast growing countries are small. Singapore is a small country and it grew fast, right? The United States is a rich country and its growth rate, real GDP per capita is around, uh, real GDP is around 3% uh, per year. That's relatively slow, okay? Likewise, with decreasing returns to scale, then small countries would grow fast. But then there's a logical, a logical um, conundrum. If small countries grow fast, if they grow fast, they get big. And then they would slow down and stop growing and there would be no growth there. Okay. Both of these increasing returns to scale and decreasing returns to scale are not consistent with the world we know. Okay, The world we know there are rich country, uh, big countries and small countries. Some big countries grow fast, some small countries grow fast. Okay. Um, and uh, the, the, uh, their growth rates does not matter, did not depend upon the size of the economy. Okay. It turns out, um, if you recall your uh, microeconomics from 100A, okay, or even Econ 1, um, constant returns to scale implies that there's constant average total cost and constant marginal cost. And it turns out, though Solo, remember Solo wrote his model, his famous growth model in 1956, more than 30 years later, a well-known macroeconomist at uh, Stanford, Robert Hall, uh, uh, analyzed the constant returns to scale of the US most industries in the United States and found uh, that most industries in the US produce in a range of output that exhibits constant returns to scale because they have constant average costs and constant marginal costs. Right? In other words, Solo made this assumption back in 1956, and it turned out it was the right assumption to make because then, in fact, that's what the U.S. economy looks like. Okay, Hall demonstrated that more than 30 years later. My own feeling on this is that Robert Solo had a strong uh, intimation uh, that the U.S. economy had constant returns to scale and use that as the assumption, right? but it is the working assumption of uh, of this model. Okay, um, to continue with this uh, and show you how uh, constant returns to scale works in the uh, aggregate production function uh, that Solo adopts, uh, Solo adopts the what's called the Cobb-Douglas production function. Again, it's a particular production function that looks like this. This is the F function. It says, uh, take K, which is the capital stock and raise it to the alpha power where alpha is a fraction between zero and one. Then multiply that by L where L is raised to the one minus alpha power, okay? This function is, is was first identified by uh, two economists, Mr. Cobb and a mathematician, Mr. Douglas. Um, or it's the other way around. Comp was the mathematician and Douglas was the economist. Um, and is a, a, a very convenient form to, for us to use. Notice there's a product, an exponent. So it has, uh, it has properties that will be convenient for uh, using the growth trick on. Um, and if we have this aggregate production function, we can demonstrate that it has constant returns to scale. Recall constant returns to scale, we multiply all inputs by lambda. So we would have lambda times K and lambda times L. And that would be this function. Instead of raising K to the alpha, we now raise lambda K to the alpha. Instead of raising L to the one minus alpha, we raise lambda times L to the one minus alpha. That's multiplying all inputs by lambda, okay? I can simplify this because I can factor the two lambdas out, right? If I factor the lambda in the first parentheses out, I get lambda to the alpha. If I factor out uh, the lambda from the second parentheses, I get lambda to the one minus alpha, okay? And recall the rules of exponents. If the same base, you're multiplying by the same base, you add the exponents. Well, we're multiplying the same base lambda here, lambda to the alpha times lambda to the one minus alpha. You add the exponents and you get 
lambda. Uh, these two become lambda. And so we have lambda times k to the alpha, l to the one minus alpha. But recall that k to the alpha and l to the one minus alpha is just y. This, all of this here is just y. So I can put that y in and I get lambda times y. And so notice I multiplied k to the al lambda, l to the lambda, and I ended up with lambda times y. That is the very definition of constant returns to scale, okay? So this production, aggregate production function, which Solo adopts and we will adopt for the rest of our analysis of economic growth, has the key property of constant returns to scale, which says that if you double all inputs, output will exactly double and implies that size, the size of the economy does not matter for economic growth. What matters is the accumulation of capital and labor, but the size of the economy doesn't matter. So small countries can grow fast and rich countries can grow fast or small countries can grow slow and rich countries can grow slow. The size of the economy does not matter. On Thursday, we'll end the lecture here. On Thursday, we'll talk about marginal productivity and diminishing marginal product. Uh, and uh, that will be a topic, uh, uh, that topic will continue on Thursday and then we'll build the solo growth model uh, uh, on the rest of Thursday, okay? Uh, it was a pleasure meeting you this first day. Um, you should read up to chapter eight, take a look at the math review. Recall uh, there is a quiz, uh, Canvas quiz opening tonight at 7, uh, at, at 7 p.m. Uh, it's available for 24 hours and answers have to be submitted on Canvas up to um, 7 p.m. on Wednesday. Okay. Um, also recall my office hours begin right now in another meeting, uh, my uh, personal uh, uh, meeting uh, that is given on the course syllabus. Okay. And at this point, I'm gonna sign off uh, and uh, uh, move over. If you have questions here, I see Alexander has, has their hand up. Uh, if you have questions, uh, then please move over to my um, my office hours. Uh, you may have to use a passcode uh, there as well. That's also given on the syllabus, and we can talk about your questions there. Thank you very much, Danny, and everybody else, Peter, and everybody else who's uh, who's uh, checking out. Uh, we'll see you uh, again uh, 1 p.m. Uh, Pacific Daylight Time on uh, Thursday.